Hello, what's up? This is Silas, my friend Steven. Say what's up to the people, Stevens. <laughs> hello, hello, every everyone. It's been a little while. I hope everyone is well. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're back for another one of our conversation series. Today we're going to be talking about the Joe Biden politics as usual student debt forgiveness plan thing. For, uh, forgiveness, whatever you want to call it. We're trying to find if there's an actual name for it, because some of these things often have some weird name to the thing, and it does completely opposite of it. But we'll just be talking about uh, random things, some information about the actual things, about the student loan debt forgiveness plan, whatever you want to call it. Then we're going to talk about just our thoughts behind uh, student, the student loan institution system, why there is student loans as that amount of black. <laughs> <laughs> we will make more sense in the intro. Tell us a bit about just what, what, what you think uh, this whole this whole boondoggle is. It boondoggles? This is one of the proper boondoggles, isn't it? This is like the oh, chicken mean of boondoggles. Yeah, because as I understand it, I mean a boondoggle is using taxpayer money to buy votes, right? Like that's basically. The idea. I know it. I know it started during the Great Depression because you heard all those stories of nonsensical jobs, like people being paid to chase tumbleweeds or like bury bottles and dig them up just to create employment. But then you realize, like, okay, that's money taken from the taxpayers that would have been used anyway, and that's mm -hmm. where the term boondoggle came from. So okay. I don't know. I don't know if it's check here. Uh, at <laughs> etymology.com was it's one of our favorite sites. Stephen and I are very into. <laughs> definitions or meanings of word. I think we like going to the history. So here's an Etty online boondoggle, a trivial, useless, or unnecessary undertaking. Wasteful expenditure. Yeah, that fits. <laughs> OED of uh, 1935 American English. Of uncertain origin, popularized during the New Deal as a contemptuous word for make work projects for the unemployed. Said to have been a pioneer word for gadget. Hmm, how? It, it was also in 1932 a Boy Scout term for a kind of woven, woven braid. But yeah, I think I think that yeah. So I think this fits. I think I shall be referring to it as boondoggle several times in this conversation as we keep going. But yeah, well, it's it just occurred to me. You said like name for a device. It sounds almost like thingamajig or thingamabob. Like it's kind of like a funny sounding word. So I think it's the same mm -hmm. kind of idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh. And so for some general background for those of y'all that uh, might not have heard of this yet, this is something to do with the United States of America. How many trillions is held in student loan? Is, is it? 1.7? Uh, sounds about right. Yeah, it's been a little while. Because I remember a few years ago it was 1.4, and I know it's definitely beyond that now. So uh. Okay, I think here, yeah, it says, okay, so here we have an AP online. It says student loan debts, the amount, it's up to $1.6 trillion, uh, $1 trillion out in student loan debts. And these loans are just a system in the United States of America. Most of these are backed by the government, and we'll get into that a bit of how this came to be, how this current, uh, the current occupant of the, of the United States, Dark Brandon, the somewhat what to call him, <laughs> he's actually been quite involved with his long-term actual status in the government. He's one of the most He's one of the most, I think he's, he's I, I guess when Hillary Clinton lost in Russia, when Russia colluded with Trump and did not kind of, because Joe Biden recently said that they need to do something to make sure that nobody steals an election again, he definitely wasn't acknowledging that there was a fortification of this recent mm -hmm. one. He clearly meant that the stealing that happened in the Russia situation when somebody involved with Hillary Clinton gave the dossier to the people and admitted and got off in court for it, th that's what he was talking about, the stealing. Not the recent one, because that was the safest, even though Trump was like the most horrible president ever. He also happened to run the safest, most fortified like, election ever. But so he's been in politics for the longest time. Hillary Clinton couldn't stay, even though she's the most qualified. But if you like politicians for being politicians and you say having experience at a certain job makes you the most qualified for this thing, then I think Joe Biden might be the most qualified in that sense, quote unquote, because he'd been a politician for the longest, I think, than any other president that was actually elected. If I'm not correct, I think I'm right in that one, right? Yeah, because I remember reading about Coolidge and they were saying he actually held more offices than any other uh, president because I think he was like city councilman, mayor, state senator, governor, vice president, president. So like his whole life was in politics. Um, mm -hmm. Joe Joe Biden, I want to say not quite that long. I mean, he wasn't I don't think he was like young, young when he got into politics, if I recall. But 
Um, he didn't. I don't think he. I think most of his life has been in politics for sure. Yeah, yeah so I see like presidential history, subsequent um, president um, history. 1972 was his first one. I think he'd been in the politics before that, though. Early career yeah. of Joe Biden, Newcastle, yeah, city count, uh, city council. He practiced yeah. law, or was a public defender. Uh, then he was a locally active Democrat, and then he got into corporate law, criminal law. Um, he and another attorney formed a, then in 1970, Biden ran for fourth district seat of Newcastle County Council on a liberal platform and public housing finance. And then I think he got in from then and then he's been in politics since 1970. So, yeah, that's that's, that's quite some time. It's almost 50 yeah. years as, as being a politician. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> that's Joe Biden. And we'll kind of go through some background of how involved he's been in the actual student loan situation that we have now and then him coming in and the actual thing right now. The loose plan, we might get into more details of it, is he capped it at, if we're single person, if you're a single borrower of, of money and you owe amount of, a certain amount, there's going to be an application process for you to qualify for it, and $10,000 if you have under $125,000 salary or annual income. I think that is pre-tax, right? Yeah, because it's it even says in the document that you have to pay taxes on there. It's taxable income, technically. Okay. So, so there's yeah. um so that, that that's there and then it's two hundred and fifty thousand I think for couples if you're making if you're earning less than that you qualify for twenty thousand I think in debt forgiveness so I think if it's just one person that has the debt I think it just comes out of that one person but that that household would qualify for that and then if you have Pell grants which is a system that for even lower income people who are identified through this government program that to be even in more need, this is their parents are in poverty, they come from whatever is defined as poverty in those states or sectors, they get extra defense. So I think with them, even if you have that, and you're still under $125,000, but you achieve, you got a Pell Grant because you were in poverty, I think you qualify for $20,000 as a single person. Now, I don't know if there happens to be two people who qualify for Pell Grants and they are making under 250,000, they might get the 40,000. So that's the general idea of it. And now there's also some other schemes and plans in this where they're saying they want to drop down the, I think the forgiveness, no, they want to drop down the maximum rate of interest you have to pay for this a certain amount of time after you graduate to 5%. Some of, the, some of them is up to 15%. The, these things, are, we'll, we'll talk about this as we get to it because this is like a, it's, it's a boondoggle. It started once the state got involved and in then it mutated the system and it just created some just a, a crap situation all around. So they want to cap it at 5% and then have a forgiveness plan that happens, um, I think after you've been paying for 20 years or something. And of course, when you go to work for the government, there's actual there's there's more incentives again for attracting people from certain jobs with certain debts and things like that into the government because when you work for the public sector there's more robust forgiveness kind of programs because I guess it wasn't bad enough that they take money that's taxed from the private sector and then they pay it into the schools to pay those salaries and then you get the loan from those public sector things and then once you get that debt and you're paying back to the public sector off the tax money that you're doing you're getting a salary from the taxations already and then some of that salary is going back to pay the debt and then after you've been <laughs> paid by tax money then they say okay we've given you we have more tax money <laughs> than you accrued debt on <laughs> and it's so ridiculous it's just like i don't know what to do <laughs> well what, what, you're, what you're describing well what you're describing essentially is a shell game for those who don't know it's the whole thing where you put things under the shells and shuffle them around but it's like it's the same thing it's like money here money there money here money there but it's like you're just shuffling debt and spending it around. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fucking yeah. crazy desire. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in this thing. but yeah so <laughs> Uh, but what, what are your general thoughts on on this whole situation? Like, okay, um, what, what do you what do you think about this? Were you surprised this happened? I I personally were not. I I, I it, it, let me yeah let me know just what what are your intro thoughts about this whole this. Well, uh, whole did you want to talk about why college become, became so expensive and everything? Yeah, That's we'll, kind we'll, of we'll, we'll get into that. But I think this this, this you can give us some thoughts of just like your your reception of when you first heard about this. Did you think it was a thing that he was actually going to do? Because we, as we know, this has been a regular campaigning yeah. thing. Like we will also talk about how this doesn't actually solve the solution. This, in yeah. a way, is 
it's 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 paying for votes, and this is one thing that I will at least tip my hat to, or say like people on both sides of this political spectrum all around the place kind of realize this is some kind of payoff. Like they, they, they realize this is not actually solving the situation. If you happen to have student loans until today, you just paid them off before they, okay. There were some issues with the legality of this, but I don't think it's a situation with legality because with the legality, somebody has to sue to say like, I am the one who's harmed on this, but then how will the taxpayer actually sue? And I don't think the standing for a taxpayer to say like, I am, I'm harmed in this situation. And then by the time I think the Republicans take control in the midterms, I think the thing would already been applied, would have been put in as an executive order. Yes, you can question whether there's still some actuality of there being an actual um, pandemic situation where there's an emergency. You can ask questions about that. But once that's already in effect and there's already people, both Republicans and Democrats, libertarians and pastafarians and everybody else out there is already starting to get that student loan debt, it's going to be a lot harder to, at that point to roll it back. And even if the, even if Trump or somebody else comes in and then they rescind the executive order, it's already would have happened. That's in two years. So I think when I first heard it, I was like, I don't think he has the power to do this. Nancy Pelosi said earlier he doesn't. The president doesn't have the power to do this. This was two years ago or a year ago, but he's done it in this sense. And I think the way it's worked, it actually will be something that's rolled out. But it's a limited time thing. It's not like we'll forgive twenty ten thousand for every year coming up. Like if you yeah. take a student loan debt now, it doesn't mean like it's. There's no assurance that if you if you're taking out debts right now to pay for your college, there's no assurance that in 10 years, once you're still paying your student loan debt, this plan, it's just, this plan is just for people, supposedly, ostensibly, who are in dire straits due to the pause and things that happened during the pandemic. So we understand most of the people who've been wanting this want a lot more. So uh, yeah, so that's my, my ramble about that. So well, what, what were your thoughts? you think this was something that he would actually do? Or do you think it's just, oh yeah, it's Biden, what else are they going to do? Well, well because you said that bit about like, <clears throat> they're not allowed to do it. But the thing is, the government technically does all this stuff it's not allowed to do. Because it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's the whole thing of the Constitution supposed to restrain the government, but there's no consequences to, you know, the government not following the Constitution. I mean, most of the stuff the government does is unconstitutional anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I figured it had a lot to do with midterms coming up. I mean, obviously they want to win them, so you know that's vote buying. Um, I think of what Thomas Sowell and uh, Ludwig von Mises always talked about about how government intervenes; it creates a problem. They do something that creates another problem. They do something that creates another pro problem, and on and on. And this, of course, is the result of previous government meddling. But it's like it's a tough thing because it's been happening over the course of several administrations, and then whoever's in power wants to get elected and reelected. But it's like the longer term solution is much harder. They may not be able to implement it. But at the same time, it's like they want votes in the here and now. So it's put a band aid just to get the votes. And I think that's the situation we're at with this. Uh. Yeah. And we, we've, we've had a, several conversations about this school kind of education type of thing, something we've been interested in. We had an entire series, a couple of series, where we're focusing on it. The specific one was uh, the. Cracks in the Ivory Tower was like an eleven-part series, but they were divided into a lot more videos. So we go into different things. So there'll be links somewhere below where you can find some of that content. And we mentioned some. We mentioned we talked about student loans at that time. We mentioned some options. I think even in this conversation, we'll get to some of the things that we think could help the situation. And of course, we'll discuss some of the negative things that happened with the situation. And um, we're talking about the amount of money. Like I said, it's one point six trillion. I'm just looking at the different charts that we have here. Uh, back in 2007, it was only 500. I'm saying 516 billion only because right now it's 1.6 trillion. So that's an increase in um, less than. It's like what? Um, 2007. Uh, it's like 15 years. It's gone up that much. It's gone up uh, 100, 100. It's gone up a trillion in 16 years. Has the actual level of education gone up? <laughs> to 100 percent, 200% in that amount of time. I don't think somebody would argue that. No. If you go further back to what was the student loan debt in 1970, I'm trying to find some charts, but I, 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 I imagine it was almost non-existent back yeah. then. But um, other things that have gone up in that 2003 range to 2013, if student loan debt is something that this is, and this is something that, at least I'm finally glad. In w one of the silver linings of something like this coming out is. I think we can now rest this whole idea that 
people on the political left, especially the younger people who been in that re about like the, the debt forgiveness of the ho- people with the homeowners or yeah. the banks being bailed out. Oh. Just get to the general understanding that people don't really care about the re- redistribution of wealth in general. Stephen and I are both anarchists in the sense that we don't like a state or government that is above the laws. We are not appreciative. We think taxation is a form of extortion. That's something that we kind of agree on. We prefer more like free market policies. We are more for like private property and that kind of thing. So it's more like towards the libertarian side of that. And we're rather strong on that. And we, I think we're relatively consistent on that. If you find us slipping on that in the previous things that we've talked about, call us out on that. So in general, the general principle of saying a government can guarantee loans for anything, there's nothing I think the government should be able to guarantee loans for. I, I want the government completely out of the education system. I, it yeah. shouldn't be a department of education. I don't think they abolish that stuff. So that's my stance on that. But once the people accept, oh, they should be in the, in the Department of Education, oh, education should be something that the government guarantees. Once you go from K through 12 yeah. and all that thing, I think Project Veritas just released a new video of some people in Connecticut uh, talking about, oh, we only hire liberals or we, we find ways to not hire conservatives, not hire Catholics, and yeah. we want them to vote in a certain way. Oh, we're hired for the kids. You're not hired for the kids. People are working for themselves. It's a yeah. boondoggle. The whole schooling and indoctrination yeah. complex is a boondoggle. To hire people that you know, there's that that one while saying those who can't those who can't teach I I, yeah. I don't think that's right because I'm going to get very semantic here because I don't think the people who can't do what they're actually trying to teach you actually can teach you about that thing mm-hmm. that's why you see the schooling indoctrination process where people are not actually coming out educated they're coming out indoctrinated the people who can indoctrinate, who can preach, who can um, ideologize or whatever, they're able to ideologize and teach and indoctrinate kids. And because that's what's being selected for in these schooling indoctrination complexes. It's not for education. The few teachers that actually are able to do their work, to to be a physicist or to be a biologist or to really Mm -hmm. write books, those are the people who can actually teach. And some of those people happen to still be in schools, but it's shrinking by the day because it's just not a it's not an environment that's in, that's that's for them. So that's our, my general basis. Do you generally agree with that? Yeah, well, I was going to add uh, James Lindsay made a really good point before he got kicked off of Twitter. You know, one of my <laughs> heroes. Fans for Twitter. But, but he said there, there's a common argument you see amongst Marxists and all their errors that like you see this in all of their literature, whether it's critical race theory, gender theory, all this. And I, I see this argument with the school system, too. They basically say, well, everyone already does X by default, but we know we're doing it and we're doing it for the right reason. So therefore, we're justified in doing it. So. You know, like, oh, well, parents indoctrinate kids into their beliefs, too. Well, kids get abused at his, at home, too. Well, you know, yeah. straight people groomed. Like, it's it's basically, but we're doing it. We're doing it for the right reason. So that's their justification. And they see it as it's either we're not indoctrinating people, which most people know is a lie now, or it's, okay, yes, we're doing it, but it's the right thing for the right reasons for that. And, like, once once I understood that, I'm like, yeah, that's, mo- that's the argument they commonly use. Uh. Yeah. So that's that's a that's a regular thing that you see there. So I think now that we've seen that people are okay with the resources being redistributed if they benefit from it, if they can imagine they benefit from it. Because think about it, most of the things with some of the general objections to the banks being uh, bailed out was oh trickle down economics doesn't work, and that's that's yeah. a made up term that I think people yeah. mostly on the politically left have been mentioning rather than oh these are what like free market capitalists. No, no, that's that's yeah. not something that they actually believe in. It's a really good article by Tom Sowell who's like no, find me actual sources of actually um, libertarian type of free market economists actually talking about trickle down, you can't find that. Um, But this is now, now they're saying, oh, this is trickle up. Oh, if you just give the money to the people below and then they spend the money, that's why the stimulus is needed and things like this. Because they were only objecting to saying that you're bailing them out and we're not seeing any of that money. That was the only objection. They weren't objecting to bailouts. They were objecting to not getting some of that some yeah. of the highs. And that's why you hear people now like, oh, well, 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 where was that? Where was that same energy when, when? We, but they they're, they're saying that to certain people who are like, look, these are my tweets when that was happening. These are my tweets when the PPP loans were coming up. Yeah. Even if you say the PPP loans are the same thing because the government shut it down, that's kind of a different situation. Yeah. Policies were things like that, and it was also not like, hey, here, keep the money for yourself and spending. Yeah. It was like, here's the money. 
if you show us that you've used this money to pay salary to the average people, yeah. to the workers, then we'll give you a refund on it. Otherwise, you have to pay this money back. That was it. And of course, it being done with the government with the trillions of dollars that were given on PPP loans. I think they found out that so far at least 200 billion or something was this thrown around. I think even in California alone, there was like, I think it reports even back in 2020 that there was already shenanigans going on, tiling up to like almost a billion. Like, so that's that's something that you want to know because the bureaucracy just doesn't, it just doesn't work. It's nobody's accountable. So, <laughs> so I think once we understand that people don't really worry about student, not really worried about the whole debt forgiveness thing, take that for granted that what we're talking about with most people, we might not accept this, but we're saying, okay, I think we both have to concede that to have a conversation about this, we say, okay, if this is the thing, my stance, Stephen's stance, I think, is they shouldn't be student loans to begin with by the government, so they shouldn't be forgiveness if you take out a loan in general for any kind of loan in that kind of sense, unless it's between private people and they decide, to, like, if if like, <laughs> Stephen let me some money the other day, if he decides, like, okay, I'm not going to, I don't need that back from you because you, you've shown me that you have this or whatever reason, that's something between two people. But when you have this third party, fourth party, nth party type of thing, the government is taking money from people who aren't even born, giving people who they haven't even tested. And so that kind of situation, it's already beyond the pale of ethical to me. So... I'm, I'm going to at least ignore that aspect of it and put that aside <laughs> so I don't have to bring it up again and say, okay, if you accept that the loans were taken out, people came in, took those loans, now they have those loans, what is the government's position in actually forgiving that kind of loan? And why should student loans be forgiven when credit card loans shouldn't be forgiven? When there's, um, people who've taken out tools or taken out uh, loans to start small businesses, should they be forgiven? Because how many small businesses were affected in the pandemic? So there's all these kind of things that you're kind of thinking about. What if you just wanted to have, to take a vacation? Like, is, is it, does it vacating, vacationing around that wanderlust type thing expand your mind and bring you like, why shouldn't you also get some reward? Because maybe you become a stronger person once you socialize with all the people on all the islands and you come back and you're like a better person and you're giving back to community. Should you be forgiven for loans because you did that? Because some people say that's what school is. School is about yeah. socializing. Like, no, <laughs> it's ridiculousness. So there's all that in there. So that's that's just some of the thoughts that, that, we're, that we're thinking about this. We're accepting that you are at least okay enough with the idea that the money's out, that's the reality of it, the money's not being paid back, that's part of the reality of it, and right now, a small percentage of that money, for whatever reason, is being forgiven, quote unquote. And if I'm being charitable to leftists, um, the whole trickle down thing, they do have a point to a degree because the, the issue is mostly the Federal Reserve, which pumps all this money in. That's all this inflation and stuff we're dealing with. And Stefan Molyneux did a good presentation on it a while back, uh, the turbocharged stock market. I don't know if you ever saw it. But basically, the argument was that because there's all this money pumping into the economy and it's driving inflation, what's happening is people are putting their money in the stock market directly or indirectly mm -hmm. to beat okay, inflation. Yeah. But the thing is, the, this is affecting the whole economy because in, in like in the past under a gold standard or something, money is, you know, I, I like what my friend Abraham said recently. He said reality is deflationary. Prices would be going down if we had sound money because you think about it, people find ways to reduce costs and all that over time. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, there's so much money being pumped into the economy that people are told, oh, don't save your money, invest it. That's how you beat inflation. But then the thing is, you have individuals doing it. You have companies doing it. Um, you know, of course, it's affected colleges because they're tied to the whole loan system and everything. So the whole system is corrupt. But I would make the point that they're attacking the wrong thing. It's not capitalism. It's the Fed and all these policies around it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. most definitely. Yeah, like, so like, I... Well, 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 sorry, one, one point I was going to add is like... um. There's something starting in the financial system tomorrow called phase, phase six, um, where they're going to be waiving. Um, so there, well, there were certain collateral requirements and uh, margin calls and things that weren't happening, and the reasoning was because of the like lockdown. But the thing was, even that's bogus because the whole point of making it easier during the lockdown was, oh, banks and whoever are supposed to loan to businesses, what do they do? They just bought stocks, they shorted stocks, all this other stuff. They shorted way more than their companies are worth even, and now the news is tightening on them, but it's like, you know, they all thought, oh, we'll just make money and pay it back, and obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. This, is, this is the thing, like the problems occur, I think, it's something I repeat, often problems occur not because of what the X is, because of how we define X. Yeah. So people are, some people are truly thinking, oh, just forgive the money, and then it'll be okay. Let, 
if you just wiped out all the student loan debt right now, what what would the solution be if the, everything stayed the same? Yes, yeah. you'd have a certain percentage of people. And I think when we talked about this, it was something like 95% of Americans of in their 20s had been to some form of K through 12. But then we actually went in the ivory tower thing. It's not that many. I think it's it's less than less than 40% actually start college. And I think the yeah. amount of people that actually have student loan debts, like they still have it. I think it. I, I don't want to. I think it's, it's it's less than 20% something. I don't know. It's not. It's not. A, it's not. A, it's definitely not a majority of. I don't think it's even yeah. a quarter of the population of the United States of America still has student loan debts. So in this situation, you are talking about people who are a minority of the population. And then, of course, some people will say there's no taxation. It's not It's not being paid for taxes or things like this. But mm-hmm. have you seen somebody from the administration actually mention that this is the amount, this is how it's going to be paid for? So we had, I've heard reports of some people, the spokesperson, she's mm-hmm. she's really bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> she's really yeah. bad. And not yeah. that I'm thinking that I would do a better job. We've been, I've been like doing these youtube videos for like since 2017 and i've seen the improvement on how i get much i get at like speaking yeah. i understand if i was in a situation where i know millions of people are watching me i know it's like <laughs> there's twos of twos or threes of people <laughs> watching this right now but if i knew there's like millions of people watching me there's like questions coming even if i had the preparation i'm not saying right now i could get up there and do better the job than she can but she's horrible at her job it's kind of yeah. like i i played american football i was a running back i was a defensive line I can't play professional football, but I can look and see like Tom Brady's really good at football, and I can see uh, someone like Mason Rudolph. I'm not sorry, I'm picking on Mason Rudolph. He's like a backup quarterback on the Steelers, and say like he's not as good as Tom Brady. <laughs> it doesn't mean it was a good world. Can you throw the ball like Mason Rudolph? No, but I have eyes. <laughs> Like yeah. this whole situation of okay, you do a better job than Kareem John Pierre, so what are you no, we can analyze this and say she's not gonna do her job. Even Jen Saki was better at her, at her job. Yeah. Of course, I most definitely Kaylee McEnany back in Trump's time was a lot better than, than yeah. Come on. But she came out and said it's all paid for, and then later on asked how much is it gonna cost, or we don't know how much it's gonna cost. How do you know it's all paid for if you don't know how much it's gonna cost? So this this is the thing with politics, <laughs> I don't understand. It, are they just lying? I think it's, it's. Does it matter? I I I don't I don't know some of these well, things. Well, I, I mean, she's clearly an affirmative action hire. Whenever I post about her, I always make that point. And because whenever because whenever they talk about her, it's always she's black, she's a lesbian, she's a woman, she's an immigrant. Like that's it. Like it's never oh she studied here or she did this in the private sector. And I think with a lot of these people, they're used to all these journalists, so called asking softball questions. So I guess maybe they overestimated how easy it would be. They thought, oh, they'll ask a few softballs until this answer. But instead, it's like they ask very, very basic questions that she doesn't have answers. And it's like, I- I'm not going to say she isn't smart enough. I don't know. But I think like she's not prepared enough because you remember with Kaylee, she had that binder with all those answers because she anticipated each question with her. I think she kind of gets up and she just thinks, oh, they're going to throw me a few softballs. But then when they ask her the most basic thing, she doesn't have answers. So, uh. yeah, she has a binder, too. And the, the weird thing is like, do people not really find it odd that you have a room with that many that many reporters yet you only have it's another one of those lies where people are like oh the like politics like they're saying like the mainstream media is is right leaning. I'm like, what are you talking about when you see someone when you have like twenty reporters and it's like every time it's like Peter Ducey or like one or two other people who have questions that go against the general typical type of questions that are being asked like it's 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 well and, and also there have been segments too comparing like how obama or whoever was treated compared to trump like you know trump it's like black unemployment is down by one percent how is this a success but then with obama they're asking questions like mr president what do you find enchanting about being in office like it's all like softballs oh. mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah okay so um this is this, sorry. so i just want to i just want to <laughs> talk to, to the americans out there this is a, a few other observations of this when some people are saying they need more student loan debt to be forgiven than ten thousand, i've seen people on both sides who want more and saying this is not enough people are still struggling yeah. we need more than ten thousand dollars and then some people who say like oh don't don't why are the people objecting it's just ten thousand dollars yeah and it's just it's 
it goes back to the whole thing, like when America says American says poverty. Like Americans literally mean things figuratively. You know, people literally mean things figuratively, especially Americans, especially when talking about political issues. Because when they say, "Oh, I'm oppressed," when Lizzo goes on straight and says she's oppressed, like, what, what do you mean? Like, no, no. Or when somebody says they're in poverty, when somebody says it's just ten thousand dollars, I'm like, ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. Yeah. Like people don't realize that still, for majority of the world don't even earn $10,000. Like yeah. many countries, majority of the countries in the world don't even have an average GDP, an average earnings of people at $10,000, entire yeah. families. Like this is this is crazy money that's being thrown around. People just The money printer just going, brrr, people are just so used to that. They, to think $10,000 is such an insignificant amount of money is crazy to me. It's, cra it's, just, it's craziness to me. Well, I was, gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna say it's funny you bring up ten grand because I was thinking, I have this friend who's kind of like left leaning, and she grew up in a wealthy family, and her parents were gonna give her ten grand to go on a trip to Egypt, and she made it sound like it was no big deal, and I had to explain to her, I'm like, <laughs> you know, most most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. What is it? The yeah. average American is under five hundred in savings, and the response was kind of like, oh, really? And then like. What I wonder when I hear stuff like that, I'm like, do you only hang out with other rich kids and you just compare your lives? It's like, oh, this friend got to go to Switzerland with 15 grand. Like, oh, my parents bought me a Honda Civic, but th this friend got a Corvette. Like, is that just you're just comparing your life to other rich kids? So then when you complain things are unfair, it's just by that comparison rather than like bigger picture. I mean, that's how it comes across to me. Yeah. Anyway, and you know? this is not even like an unnatural thing. Like we all like Stephen and I have conversations. So when we're talking about things, I I often think, OK. I'm comparing it. I wonder what Stephen would think about this or people in our <laughs> circle. So uh, you kind of relate that way, but then you can go out to that. And I do understand with, with some celebrities, like with someone like Lizzo, she might say she's oppressed, but she's only focusing on people in her circle. You know, when a Meghan yeah. Markle comes out and says, oh, I'm oppressed, like I, she's in her mind, she's elevated from the hoity-toity regular people. And in some way she is as being a princess of sorts, but she's married yeah. into like the most like wealthy uh, white supremacist family like in existence right now yeah. and she's married and elevated herself into that so she's not looking at some single mother living in like 50 miles from her in LA like struggling day to day working three jobs to take care of her two kids because her husband like left and things like no she's not thinking about that person she's looking at the other princesses and princesses and seeing the little that she knows about them and thinking yeah in her perception of how they're treated, I am oppressed. So I can kind of get that because that's a common thing that we do, but then we have to understand there are some things where it's like, realistically, are you though? And um, there's, there's, there's a sadness of this because reality itself does teach you, does strengthen you, does form a stronger mind. And when you've been sheltered and stuck in these kind of small little bubbles, I think you are yeah. detached from actual general society. Like we're just talking about how like when you have kids, they kind of burst your bubble and make you look at things in a different sort of way. And that's that's a, a simple thing. And then a lot of these people in these kind of environments and these kind of ideation, ideologies, ideations are stuck in their own little arrested development that they don't really see out of these little bubbles that they're in. And it's, it's, it's tough because reality is going on and eventually some of these people are faced with reality and they just crumble from it. But maybe uh, America is, and the West is actually good enough to maintain these people in their, like, like a, is, is, is Lizzo ever really going to have to face reality? Probably not. She's got enough no. money to deal with any, like health, most of the health issues should come from her weight. I don't think she's like horrible with like funding. I think even she stopped making music right now, she's probably made enough to be rather wealthy and well off for the rest of her life. If Meghan Markle yeah. got a divorce, she'd probably be fine. She'd probably still have her hundreds of millions. I, so I, I yeah. Yeah. why should they, why should they do anything? Yeah. Why should the kids who are graduating with these student loan debts really change if they're going to have some sort of forgiveness program where they understand after a certain amount of years, I'm just not going to have to pay this money back if I just work for the government. And so I, I, I understand this kind of thing, but <laughs> regardless, it's just, it's just blah. <laughs> Well, I, okay. I also wonder with some of these types, like the person I described, like if there's some kind of like on some level, maybe consciously or subconsciously, like they know how well off they are. But if they compare, if they look at the bigger picture, then they, they would have to own up to the fact that, OK, my life's not that bad. Maybe a lot of the shortcomings are my own fault, all that. Like I have way more opportunities than most people, but it's like mm -hmm. they don't want to accept that because then they have to look in the mirror. And I think for some people it's like 
they'd rather just say live in that bubble and just compare themselves to similar people. You know, again, I yeah. mean, that's my speculation. <laughs> and this is this is a, this is a thing we've talked about. Why, why does the people I think it's so bad to be considered average? Like the, I'm I'm average at most things in my life. That's yeah. by definition of what, what what these kind of things are. And that's not yeah. necessarily a negative thing. But some people are also below average in a lot of things. And I think that's why you look at somebody like somebody who look at like an Elon Musk and say, oh, Elon Musk has 40 billion. I know some people, oh, he has 40 billion. He should give that money to, to yeah. stop world poverty. And he was like, OK, give me a plan. We're a world economic forum, we're a world health organization. Give me a plan of how I'll stop it with 40 billion. I'll donate 40 billion. Nobody actually brought a plan out because they're just yeah. saying. But when you look at somebody of means, you say, OK, that person should do more. Going back to um, Tom Brady and Mason Rudolph. If you see like Tom Brady's in the Super Bowl, he does something you're like, okay, Tom Brady is held at the highest standard because you've seen the ability that he has. You think you expect more out of him. Yet you wouldn't expect me to to bring to have a Super Bowl winning comeback because that's just not something that I can do. But yeah. if you look at Tom Brady, you'll expect it. And I think with the American dream, and I think this is part of the problem with this, it's a dream, it's not reality. People need to face actual reality. And the West itself has has done this, it's it's done this to itself in some way. It's created it's created this fantasy type of existence that does not really mesh with just typical reality. It's yeah. part of this is a state growing in there and growing to that side. But but regardless, it's created these groups of people who are just not realistic, who have too much, who have been told like, oh, you you can do everything. Oh, you're American. You're something exceptional about being an American. And then yeah. they personally know themselves. They live with themselves day to day. They know they're not exceptional. But then you have to pretend you're exceptional. You have to talk each other up. You, everyone in school will be telling you, oh, all you got to do is college. You go to college, you will, everything will come to you, and then you'll be graduating, and then you'll be doing this, you'll be saving the world, you'll be doing all these things. And then they get up, and they don't really have the ability to do this. When they look at politics, they start leading some stuff like, I don't really understand this bill. Oh, I, I thought I was going to vote for this person, and then I'm going to do this. But when I went to work and I tried to like figure this out, I couldn't really understand why this is being done. So this other person came in and gave this suggestion. It's like, wow, how come you not see that? So they understand. Like Lizzo knows she's heavy, regardless of how she moves, regardless of her being stronger and more limber than 99% of the heavy people in the world. But she knows when she walks around, she feels gravity. She's probably the kind of person who, like, this is my experience from being a lot more obese than I am now, being recovering like a obese person. There was a time when I was like lying on my back in bed, and you could feel like you, you literally can't yeah. breathe. That is something that's 100% happening to someone like Lizzo, whether she likes it or not, whether she acts like it or not. So even if she puts on that brave face, she knows how she is in person. Yeah. Like all these. So so I think there is an aspect of that where these people know somehow they know. Some of them fell for lies. Some of them realized my parents weren't smart enough to realize that I wasn't this. If they realized my parents weren't smart enough to give me better advice about my student loans, and they go back, okay, how come my teachers didn't tell us? Okay, that's an entire system that I've invested in. Oh my God, like 95% of the kids are being put in the system. Oh my God, like we're supposed to be in the greatest country in the world, yet they're somehow doing this to all the kids. And when you start admitting all that stuff, it can be a harrowing, terrifying type of thing to realize yeah. how much luck and chance and all these things kind of exist, how much it's on you to actually achieve these things. And then you also realize you don't really have that many abilities. Your friends around you are lying to you or they're not aware. It's it's a tough thing. So I can understand in some way how daunting it could be to be in a situation where you took student debts out or you've believed in a certain kind of system and you find yourself in a position where that system has been proven to be shown to be wrong, and you can either face it up and try to do something about it, or just pretend like nothing is happening. Well, to sort of add to your point, for some cases, it may not even be that the parents aren't smart enough, but I see it in my own family, because I mean, I, I have some pretty intelligent, some successful people in my family. I think the problem is that a lot of the the boomer generation they think college the college system is the way it is it way they think it's still the way it was when they went, and they don't understand like for example. Um, <clears throat> a close relative of mine talked about like, oh, college was worth every penny, you know, and he he paid a lot less for college. He got a good job, all that. So it's like, yeah, of course, he's nostalgic, but he's assuming that's how it still is today. And I and others have tried explaining, yeah, if you study certain things that are economically viable, you can pay off the loans in a relatively short time. Like, what is it like? Petroleum engineers make like 90K a year starting off or something. So, yeah, mm -hmm. if something like. Something something like that, it's worth it because, you know, if you 
don't go to the top college, you work hard, put a lot of money aside. Yeah, you can pay that off in a short time. But if you study all the stuff I always make fun of, like gender studies, whatever, it's like, you know, you're not guaranteed a job and then add on that you paid way more than you would have in the past. And then that's how we get this mess we're in. Uh. Yeah, there was there was this kind of thing. This is one of the one of the regular kind of arguments that goes around there. Or people mock these people. Um, this was posted by Kasim Rashid Esquire. I don't know if it's actually an Esquire, uh, but in, he <laughs> says, "Okay, it's a tweet." He says, "Maga Boomer, at your age, I paid off college and bought a house with hard work." Millennials, at your age, college was three percent of median salary. Now it's twenty percent. And median yeah. home inc home was seventeen k. Now it's three hundred and sixty three k. The top marginal tax rate was 70%. Now it's 37%. You worked hard and then closed the door behind you. So what do you think about that? Because I have, I have some thoughts on this where it's like, yeah, a general thing, but then the response is also blah. Yeah, because, I mean, I think the point about, like, the percentages makes sense. And that was the, what I was trying to explain to that male relative. Like, yeah, you paid a fraction of the price. You know, you paid off your college in a short time. You got a good paying job. Yeah, of course. But it's like it's not like that now and telling kids it's still like that go to college that's what's creating the mess but at the same time like it does also you know they use in business language uh what is it um caveat emptor buyer beware i think like there has to be a bit more of that too because it's like understand that these colleges are out for themselves you know i mean i, mean, I made mm -hmm. the point several times in our cracks in the ivory tower series like i don't see universities as these like and the people who work in them and these, these, these like heroic figures that put aside self-interest because they care about you. It's like yeah. they have they have an agenda same as anyone else. It's just do your agendas coincide or is it are they, you know, slipping in some lies because they want to enrich themselves at your expense? And then also add on that the banks are guaranteed the loans. Of course, the government wants the people in power want you to vote for them, all those other factors. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing. There's no such thing as not-for-profit uh, education. It's not, there's no not-for-profit anything that happens in in society yeah. in, in actuality. I see some charities, but even there's actual profit of somebody feeling better about themselves that they gave charity, yeah. even if you discount the tax write-off in most cases. Okay, so with, with, with something like this, first of all, I I think I I personally know people. We, we know some people. We met some people in New York City. They end up actually leaving New York City, but it's probably part of why it's people like Kasim Rashid who agrees that things like this and call people mega boomers don't really interact with people like this because they leave the places where people like Kasim Rashid live. Uh, they they met in they met through a philosophy group uh, in New York City. They were younger. They were in their twenties. I think. Uh, the, the guy was first generation from, I mean, actually, I think he was born abroad and he was, became an American on my turn, first generation. But anyway, they moved to somewhere in the South, South Carolina and now they eventually moved to, um, I think, somewhere in West Virginia, have a kid, yeah. bought a house. They're in their 20s. And yeah. they paid for college, both of them. Like, it, it, it's so, that's still happening. I think majority of the people, as you mentioned, it's like despite being despite making up only 13 percent of the college degree population, graduate degree holders make up 56 percent of the student loan debt. I think yeah. most people wouldn't realize that it's actually that amount of money. They might think, OK, there's not that many people with graduate degrees, but it's the amount of actual money that these people take out. So there are still a lot of schools that have single digit percent it might not be up to like 10 percent, but you can go to community colleges for two years and then you can go to a four year four year to finish it up there's different ways you can actually get to the situation you can of course get scholarships if you actually yeah. qualify for the actual school and things like this so there's ways to get your, your there's many, very many ways to get your actual income for your average for for pretty much most degrees that don't pay like petroleum engineering, you're not going to find a single percent digit of median salary for that because of the amount of earnings that's in there. But you're also not going to find a single digit percentage. You might not find one for like some esoteric type of Greek historical like yeah. way women were raised. That, that kind of stuff may also be some very niche type of thing that's offered by only two or three colleges. So if you're going to go there, they're going to be able to charge you like Twenty thousand dollars, aka a semester, things like that. So if you if you're going out for that, that's a different thing. So when you're talking about this, first of all, people do pay it off in their twenties. Second, there are cheap schools out there you can actually find it. As for the taxation, what does it have to do with college or home ownership in this situation? Like you can tell this somebody who's a leftist, they just want to throw that taxation in there. And also, what percentage of people back in the day, in the boomer times, were actually going to college? What were they going to college for? 
what was the actual level of admission to the college? Like, what were the standards? They probably still had IQ tests back then. We're going to give you an IQ test to see if you can actually well, afford the school. I, w- I want to get into that as the conversation okay. goes on. Yeah. All right. So there's, there's, there's things like that. So that's definitely a difference with it. it it's, so the, if you can say, like, okay, they sh- they know, how do they close the door behind them? Someone like Kasim Rashad, I think he, Rashid, who he's talking to, I think it's people on the political left. Maybe it's someone on the political right. I don't know. But he's, he's talking about this kind of stuff. Like, okay, so if you're saying they close the door, how do they close the door? Did, did they go into colleges and close the door? No, they, some of these boomers are still in there. But if it's a MAGA boomers, people more on the right, I don't think they're that involved in the schooling indoctrination complex. No. If you're saying they voted in politicians and did negative things, we'll get into a, <laughs> into a short discussion about some of the things that people like Joe Biden did. So yes, if some of these people in that boomer age, let's take the MAGA out of it, voted in politicians and that set up the policies and went to the Fed and did all these things that have just mucked up the entire system. If they've done that, have the millennials actually been shown to have a different voting pattern to have better politicians? No, the millennials came in too and continued this crap. So miss me with this nonsense of saying, oh, it was different in the boomer times. And the, no, because the boomer times bought into the American dream, taught the American dream to the kids, sent their kids to the school and indoctrination complexes that brought up the kids. They should be better as parents and more more aware and more into their kids, what's happening to the kids, and teach them other ways. And there's still a vast majority, like we mentioned, 13% hold 56% of the student loans. So majority of Americans don't have student loans. So you can be part of those people. So I just I just want to dispense with that for good in this conversation, this whole idea that it's a majority type of thing where like most people fall for this. No, most Americans, despite the schooling indoctrination complex, despite all the policy goals, despite all the guarantees, despite the promises, most Americans have seen through that nonsense. So if you want to pretend that, oh, we have the most educated voter and then we're the Democrats, we're the left, we're the ones who support student loan forgiveness, yet at the same time, let's drop that, uh, let's drop the, the voting age to 16. We have the most educated voters. This, you can, these voters were fooled, they were fooled, but then, when they're voting for us, they haven't been fooled by voting for us. It, it, it's absurdity. Oh, they, they can chop their breasts off and no, no, they oh, they, they can't understand what's happening with with a student loan. It's 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 just a whole mix of just nonsense that yeah. I want to dispense with. That most people don't fall for the student loan debt trap, especially that top level of hundreds of thousands. Did, yeah, um, yeah, I pretty much agree. Did you want to get into the origins of how all this started, or? Yeah, uh, just one second uh, before we get to that. With the, I just want the chart here, I'll uh, we'll put it on the screen, I think, um, or it's just here from the AP News. So just to get another better idea of how the student loan debt is in there, I think and they said it's uh, the highest one is 20K to 40K, which is about 9.7 9, 9. million people has that. And then um, below that is 9.3 uh, million people have 10K to 20K. So with those people who are forgiven, so anyone below this, the seven seven point one million people have um, seven have less than five k. Uh, seven point five million people have uh, five to ten k, and then nine point three million people have ten k to to twenty k. So these people, that's about um, fourteen. That's about twenty. That's about thirty. Thirty. It's twenty five million people might have an entire student loan debt forgiven just from yeah. this kind of thing. So that's that's still a significant amount of people. Whatever you yeah. want to imagine and say, okay, there's people with this kind of cohort that once they're freed from this debt, they'll be able to go and pay for other things. I don't think that's quite right, because as you mentioned, yeah. people are still, like majority of, two thirds of, of Americans don't have more than $500 of savings, is that, is that kind of thing? It's, a, it's the whole credit, this is something that I realized even before I started to realize some of these bigger things about the United States of America. I realized in my when I was still in college, the majority of America is ran on credit. I was yeah. like, no way the rest of the world can actually adopt this system. And I think we'll transition from this into like how it began because I'm starting to see this system of student loan debts being shipped out to other countries as well. It's, it's already yeah. been in America where they ship in people from other countries. But then when you do that, when you come in from other countries and you have to pay more, We'll get to that, but it's it's being brought like here in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm starting to see student loan debts being kind of brought up. I'm like, no, no, we don't need to bring that system here. So um, the next one is um, so now above this says 40k to 60k. That's 4.3 uh, million people. Uh, two like 2.6 million people have 60k to 80k. 1.4 million people have 80k to 100k. 2.4 million people have 100k to 200k. And one million people have over two hundred k, two hundred thousand. 
in student loan debts. So you can see it's much less above 20 to 40K, but one of those people in the 200K can account for like <laughs> how many people in the less than 5K. So that's that's the, the situation. So the people who are truly dealing with this trillions of dollars in student loan debt are those top percentage of people. So this is a, if you are one of those, oh, we are the 99% of people, just realize that this is a situation that is actually mostly held by a small percentage of the population and most yeah. of them are not really doing things that would anyway anyway say this was an actual valid investment but yeah let's 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 go ahead and get into well, how this and to, you, to your point it's funny because i made that argument to people before and they've said that's your opinion i'm like it's not my opinion it's the market's opinion if you were if you had skills or knowledge that was valuable somebody would be paying you for it if it's just something you find interesting it's a hobby if it's just a hobby why do you have a right to have it paid for by other people? Oh. Yeah, it's similar to like your, the last conversation we had with the sexual market value. Like there's there's yeah. markets in any kind of interaction with society. If you have something valuable, you'll do it. And you should kind of wonder why so many schools are so open to dropping standards of actual admission because what are what what is the value of just churning students through the schools like what is the value to the actual to the actual schools that people need to start realizing that why did the price of education shoot up yet the, the consumer price index hasn't gone up like it's, it's, it's the, the average salaries of the people who are graduating from colleges hasn't shot up but the yeah. cost for going to college has shot up like there's so many things yeah. where it's like how do you not see this and just have many many questions uh -huh. all right so we will get into the origins of it now uh, yeah Okay, sure. So the way I would explain it to people is this, is there are a few factors that led to this situation. So one thing I learned courtesy of the guys over at Praxis, we've talked about them in numerous presentations. They're an um, alternative to college. It's like an apprenticeship program. Um, one of the things Zachary Slayback, he's the former business director, taught me is that a lot of people have misconceptions of historically what, what school and higher education was. I think People have this idea that there was some golden era where you just went to school to become educated and then you you went out to become productive in the world. And the thing is, for certain people, that was true. Like, OK, if you were a doctor, you went to college, um, you know, if you had money and you wanted to be a lawyer, you went to college. Uh, academics, obviously. Yeah. But colleges, aside from that, it was mostly, you know, it was for like some they've, they've compared them to sort of like summer camps for the rich where you had like finishing school and things like that mm -hmm. like someone posted recently how liberal arts was originally oh my son my son comes from a wealthy family and i want him to learn all these things because this is what a son from a wealthy family is supposed to know and how to be a proper gentleman so i want him to learn history study latin greek all that um so there's that they were also religious institutions the first one university of bologna is in italy that's the longest running university and yeah, and then the other category is just the people who had to go, like I say, doctors, lawyers, whoever. But it's like somehow this notion developed that if we push well, – well, well, what it is is that you had all these successful entrepreneurs. Like you can take Rockefeller, Carnegie, whoever, ultra successful, very little formal education. They – once they became successful, they sent their kids to colleges for the reasons I mentioned. And then what ended up happening was people say, hey, we have all these wealthy people going to college. If we send our kids there, they'll be like those people. But again, that's putting the cart before the horse because it's – these people were successful. I just wanted them to learn how to become gentlemen and ladies. Um, yeah. I don't know if I mentioned – I don't know if I mentioned this before, but um, I'd forgotten there was a line in Titanic where uh, Ruth, Rose's mother, says to her friends – the purpose of university is to find a suitable husband. Rose has already done that, but that, but that was that was it. It was yeah. like, oh, you're going to send your daughter to meet some handsome rich guy from another a successful family, then they're going to get married, and then she's either going to stay at home, or if you're a guy, he's going to find a wife, or you're going to network with other rich people, all that. It's not like you went to Harvard, learned everything you could about business, and then became successful from that. That's yeah. not what happened. Yeah. It was more yeah. like your dad had had a, had a business and then he needed you to take over the accounting. So he sent you yeah. to college to get the accounting kind of knowledge that was in there. And that's a system yeah. that can still be done today. Like I just this is one of the few one of the, just the new fixes that I think could be done with just a school in the, in the United States of America, even the same kind of system. This whole idea that you have to go straight out of college, uh, straight out of high school doesn't really make sense. Why don't you no. just take some time off? This is something we've talked about several times before. Just you can even take out a loan for this. Take out a loan of like two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars. 
travel around America, just the states that you're living around, do some part-time jobs here and there, get to see how different people live in different areas. Even just go to like a college town and be like, okay, this is the actual college town that I probably want yeah. to go to. I want to go to a school like this, get a job at like a supermarket or something in the area, just test out the area. Most schools, you can actually just walk in on campus and sit in on classes and kind of see if it's something you like. And then with that loan that you've taken for those $2,000, you also working so you can get like some pay, some, some, you can pay back that loan right after you have it. It's already improving your credit score when you want to take out the final mm -hmm. loan. Then you can get to that point. Like, why do you have to do it when you're 18, 19? Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just not something that, that makes sense to me. It's, and, and as you mentioned, I, I just don't understand how it switched from that. And looking here, uh, find out some, found something here with the history of it. It said back in 1940, uh, the graduates of, was only 1,860, 1, uh, well, no, 186,500. Um, yeah. And that means less than 5% of the adults uh, 25 or older in the U.S. had a college degree. This is back in 1940. Then okay. uh, by, in, by 1950, the number of college graduates nearly tripled, and that's still tripled. It's only 432,000. So why? what was the switch all of a sudden? It's like 1970, you have 839,000 already. And then, uh, yeah, so it, the, the things just kind of just exponentially kept growing. But has America been so much more successful? This is something that people ask, like, a lot of people in current year just damning the history. The, the few people in history or the people in the past, oh, these few people in the in the past had these backward cycle ideas, or they were negative, or they were oh. this. But then what have they personally done in their lives? Or what has these yeah. generations actually achieved? Who are the people who are achieving much in these actual life? Like it's 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 an it's an odd type of situation. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring up 1972 because that's a very important year. That was that's the second part of my point. That that was when there was a Supreme Court case called Griggs versus Duke Power. So, for those who don't know, that was basically where it was ruled that IQ tests or similar things were considered discriminatory for employers to administer. Now, I think that's stupid because as you're gonna, as you're probably thinking, well, the whole point is to discriminate. You're selecting for more or less intelligent people. Now. I don't think IQ is the be all end all. I think, you know, it's been shown empirically that you're more likely to have a successful life the higher your IQ is and all that. Um, I don't think you need to be a genius to be successful. I mean, there's plenty of people of average or slightly above who are. Um, but the problem, what happened here was because they were considered discriminatory, employers could no longer test to see if people were competent. So what's the solution? Well, let's send people to colleges and then colleges will sort out, okay, who's, small, who's less or more intelligent. But then what ended up happening was it became well, okay, everyone has to go to college to prove that they're worth it. But then what ends up happening is all these people who in the past couldn't even get in, they couldn't handle it, so they had to lower the standards, mm -hmm. then get into things like affirmative action, legacy hires, all that, or legacy uh, admit admissions, I mean. Um, and then what ended up happening was you had to dumb down the curriculum to meet the all these people who couldn't get in in the past, and what ends up happening more and more people have bachelor's degrees, that is less value. Then what? You need a master's. Okay, so then that is less value. You need a PhD and on and on. And then add on top of this with the Fed creating all this easy money, especially from the 70s on after, you know, the gold standard was ended. Um, add on the fact that colleges basically ran with it because they thought, well, if the government's going to push people into college, they're going to guarantee loans. Why don't we milk this as much as we can? And that's why college has gone through the roof. Like, um, I paid 32 a year for culinary school, which is like considered pricey for a culinary school. But like Pratt, the Art Institute in Brooklyn, that's 50 grand a year, and that's four or five years, depending what you study. So it's just it's got it's gotten way out of sight. And like, I have to believe people other than people like us sit here and think like we know it doesn't cost this much for people to learn. Like it's just like yeah. you know, it's like this money isn't all. It's not worth every penny. Like I said, my boomer relative said, yeah, but it's like you paid so much less and you got a job. So sure, but if. If it's like you're like Pratt, you're studying art. I mean, artists are notoriously poor, hence the expression starving artist. You know, yeah. it's like unless you either make it really big or you're able to support yourself by other means or something, it's like you're you're probably not going to become a millionaire producing art. You know? <laughs> yeah. And it, it's just another thing with the K through 12. This is another damning that another damning note against the K through 12 system. The more people have been through the K through 12 system, supposedly yeah. the more they need. Postgraduate, the they yeah. more they need bachelors, the more they need masters, the more they need postgraduates in order to actually earn the same amount that people were making without even high school yeah. degrees back in the day. Like, what is happening for your society for you to think this yeah. is actually something that's actually working? Like, why do people still hold K through 12 in such a high system? You'd think if they've invested all that money in K through 12 already, that hey, these kids should be actually a lot better without college. But no, 
it's just been attached. And I think it's also part of that where people are just like, oh, I didn't have to apply for my K through 12. So why the hell should I have to really apply? Why should they all of a sudden be these higher standards for me to go to yeah. college? I should just us be able to go into it. That's why some people are like, oh, we should just also have free or tuition free uh, college. That's not going to improve the situation. There's yeah. a way to be tuition free K through 12. Why do you think tuition free post K through 12 is going to actually improve any kind of situation? Yeah. And it's just the argument of the government's had you for 12 years already. If you can't produce anything after that, it's like, is it going to be a magical four years where you become super valuable? Like, it doesn't make sense. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you're talking about with this 1970 thing here. I got this little excerpt from The Interceptor. They were talking about this article about Biden's, Biden's – it's an interesting article. I'll leave a link below as well. You can check that out. It's saying, uh, early in his senatorial career, Biden played a role in making it easier for students and parents to take out burdensome loans. Spanning across several decades, later his landmark bankruptcy reform legislation made it nearly impossible to discharge student loans, birthing a predatory industry and sinking millions into unsustainable levels of debt. And then now he's, of course, now forgiving the $10,000 without actually fixing the system. So he's been in there in the beginning, the middle, and the end, because he said that was 1970. He said in 1978, I don't know if you, this is something you might mention, but in 1978, Biden supported the Middle Income Student Assistance Act, which eliminated income restrictions on federal loans to expand eligibility to all students. Biden helped write a separate bill that year, blocking students from seeking bankruptcy, bankruptcy protections on those loans after graduation and income restrictions of federal loans were reinstated in 1981. Hmm. Um, then, um, then he went on to vote and create a parental loan for undergraduate students, a PLUS program in 1980, the Auxiliary Loans to Assist uh, Students or ALICE program in 1981, which extended loan eligibility to students with no parental financial support. So yeah, mm. you can you can see there's some of these things. Um, you can also uh, for some of y'all who know how the United States of America is organized business-wise, even there's certain states like Delaware and Las Vegas, and I think there's one more where a lot of companies register and because it's you no know, income tax, there's some tax breaks for corporations in certain ways. So they just have like a PO box and then registration there. There's a lot of credit card and loan bank type of companies that are somewhat located in Delaware where uh, mm. <laughs> Joe Biden was a pol top politician in there. There might be some some things with some benefits for him voting certain ways and certain things that you can check out. Not saying it's that way, like 10% for the mm. big guy type of thing, but you can you can check that out and, and let it out. So yeah, I can continue a bit with the history of, of, of this and what else is happening besides uh, Joe Biden being involved in it. Yeah, because I mean, like like I said at the beginning, it's the sole Mises thing of like, you do something like, oh, everyone has to go to college, make it easy for everyone to go to college. Then it's, oh, I want to help out the banks by making it not bankruptable. But then it's everyone's complaining they have all this debt and they can't find a job. So forget that. So it's just one intervention after another. Then it's sort of damage control trying to rein that in. You know? <laughs> yeah. And because that's going back to what this person was saying with the millennials, it's like, Right now, they're saying the state needs to bail us up, but the state is the one who created the problem to begin with. Why is that person? It's like, oh, man, this drug dealer has been giving us all these drugs, and I'm so messed up on drugs. Man, that drug dealer, you need to give me something to get off of these drugs. Why would they do that? What is the incentive yeah. for the drug dealer to get you off the drugs? They'll sell yeah. you some other drug, or oh, this drug will fix you from that other drug, but now you'll be hooked <laughs> to that same drug dealer off of that other drug. It's yeah. it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. No. So... um. Yeah, I didn't really have much else to say aside from okay. that. Uh, yeah. So there was that with Biden. Let me see if there's anything else he had in 1984. I said, do it loans. Um, so international fines under that bill, which was signed into law by President Long. So Ronald Reagan was also involved in this. I know people on the political yeah. right are like, oh, Reagan, Reagan, Reagan. Like, nope. <laughs> well, you know, you know, too, the thing with the hospitals, the emergency rooms where they can't turn away anyone, even if they don't pay, that was a Reagan thing, too. So it's like you know, free market conservatives. And it's like, you could argue, oh, is someone dying? Should they be turned away? But it's like, you don't get like the hospitals have to recoup that cost somehow. And then another conversation, but you have issues with illegal immigrants too who use it, they don't pay for it. It's like, again, how are you gonna, you know, it's just, it, it's all these unsustainable, you know. And this, this is why we're anarchists. We're just saying like right now in the state, the state is a system where how is the state held accountable for anything that they do? Not, in almost yeah. every situation where the state has messed up, the solution yeah. seems to be we didn't spend enough money on it. 
We didn't have yeah. enough people yeah. handling this, so we need a new department. Like, look at right now, the CDC finally coming out and saying, you know, we kind of did this wrong. But it's not like we did this wrong. We need to be shut down and listen to the yeah. other people who, because there were people who had things right. There, there were people who were saying things that the CDC is saying now. They were saying that back in 2020, like someone like Scott Atlas and people like that, the Great Barrington Declaration coming out the Stanford University and all of these other people, just randos. Like, I got some videos where I was saying some stuff right, because like, I was listening to some people who were saying other stuff right, just general observations. There's other countries like Sweden and things like that that did things in different ways. So that whole idea, but the CDC is not saying we failed and we should not be held, we should not be expected to do this next time. This is just not our bag. They're saying we failed and give us a whole bunch of bags so we can open a department and train people so we, next time we can have more control of this. And it's only the government that really has a system like this. Every other more private free market kind of situation. If you mess up, you are held accountable by the market. You're held accountable by your consumers. You are held accountable by your, your, your competition actually says, these people messed up and this is how we're going to do it differently. But what is the alternative when you have a system like this, right? There's no other alternative department of education that can say, we're now in charge of setting the standards for people to actually have student loans. We're the ones who are actually starting our own sort of banks outside the system and we have a system where we guarantee we're going to test and we're going to test out everybody who takes loans from us. We're going to test it out and we'll actually help you as somebody who's taking a loan from us to be better at paying us off because we know that when you go out and you're successful, you'll be like, these people helped me out. So you'll be advertising for us. So this it could actually be incentive when they say, okay, you shouldn't take this job because we've done a study on this job. And if you take this job, you, if you take this degree, you're probably not going to be able to pay us back. So we don't even want to give you this. But if you do take this other degree and you've qualified for it by the education that we see you've had, the capacity you have, you will definitely be able to pay us back and then advertise for us. So to let a, a institution that's giving out, and this is this is how things used to be in the free market, because people used to actually give out debts. Yeah. People used to give out loans. In private people used to give out loans. This is already happening with scholarships. When you have scholarship programs, the, there's people, there's hedge funds, there are rich people, wealthy people, and other people just who come together and crowdsource actual things. This is one thing that happens here in Kenya. Yeah, It's a harm-based system where a kid mm -hmm. in the family is trying to go to college. He's he's shown that I've had the scores. I've actually been admitted to this college. Now I'm actually going to go. And then the family members come together and friends and people like that. People send like a hundred, like a few dollars here and there. Some people put more and things like that. And then they get the money together and they pay for school that way. If they, the kid doesn't have the payment for the next term, sometimes they'll take some time off and do some work or something. But that's, that's how it works here. And that system is still there. There's still a way to have a more accountable and effective system of helping the people who are not able to help themselves for various reasons. But a lot of people just think, oh, the government has it, so we don't need to be involved in it when the government doesn't have it at all. We can do a separate presentation on it, but my experience in investing, I'm learning how corrupt the SEC and DTCC are. For those who don't know, that's a clearing corporation that um, they deal with a lot of stock market regulation. And a lot of people don't get that. Like the head of the SEC, he's appointed by the president, but he usually comes from one of the big banks. So of course, there's ties there and whatever. Yeah. And then uh, the people, like there was something recently about how um, there were rules that if something drops so low or so uh, goes up so high, it has to be halted. But the thing is, the people who are writing the rules were people who were short a certain position. So it's like, you know, if it goes up, they're going to halt it immediately. So there's all this like BS that goes on. And it's just now because retail has coordinated, communicated, there's all these forums and things it's being exposed. And like a lot of us are realizing this kind of stuff has always gone on. It's just there's more light being shown on it now. Uh, yeah, and that, uh, that's that's one of the positive things that I think with current timeline is we're realizing that schools have been this corrupt and messed up for some time. It's not that, oh, Harvard was so much better. Like, because that's, I think that's something that some people were shook about once they saw like the rock going to the Ivy Leagues. Like, no, that's always kind of been there. It's always been yeah. some kind of old boys club where there was kind of handshakes. Yes, they happened to have a situation where there was enough competition in that kind of more privatized environment without the state being into it, that they still right. had to attract the best teachers. And if you did send your kid there, you had to afford it, so that was already selecting a few group of people. But the best teachers were actually in there, and there was still some sort of rigor because there's a lot of word of mouth, like, you, you're you Harvard, I'm a Harvard man. So you get out of there, you should be sure to actually have some actual level of achievement. So there's, and also just like the simple like IQ test, things like that, there's, there was just a higher standard of getting into these things, but not that doesn't mean that they were not also still 
I don't know, inclusive, closed off little clubs. And not, I, I, have, I have no problem with clubs. I'm okay with discrimination. I'm okay with, yeah. with black women saying, I only want to date like black men that are six foot tall, six foot five and earn 70K. And like say yeah. that and say nobody else, you should be having the selection to discriminate to your extent. If you can afford it and you can not have to do it. But Harvard discriminating people from entering Harvard is not saying you can't go learn this from somebody else. So that, yeah. that's that's my kind of situation. I am objecting to people saying you have to have this only. This is the only one source, and we're going to prevent you from going to other sources. But anybody should be able to like. You don't have to date me, but I'm not stopping you from dating everybody else. That's that's kind of my my whole mentality. Some of these things. Well, there, again, we can do another presentation on it. But there's some interesting stuff going on in the financial markets where. Um, other countries are actually cracking down on certain things that our institutions are doing in their own countries, like <laughs> naked shorting, all this. But the, but the thing is, and the thing is, what's funny is like in Canada, South Korea, Germany, they're all complaining that our regulators don't do anything. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want government overreach in general, but it shows the importance of competition because you think about it like there's people in those countries that use our institutions, but the the people there don't want their people getting ripped off. So they're going to say something. Yeah. And then if like, if everyone kind of says something and my argument is that like in a truly anarchist society, there'd be all these people calling all this stuff out and that would put pressure on them to change. So it illustrates the point to a degree. I mean, again, still government, but it's like there's competition. Whereas in, in these last few decades, we were just relying on the SEC, DTCC, whoever just to do their job. And it's like, it's obvious they aren't so. Oh. Yeah, and this is this relying on state bureaucrats who these people are not really accountable to anyone. Um, no. They don't really get fired for doing the job. They get shifted to other places. Very hard to fire some of these people. What's what's the incentive? Their salary is not really going to shoot up that much higher if they do a better job. They, they're really no. stuck at that salary. There's no incentives, no like commission for being actual better at your job, no. or there's no like knockdown for being worse at your job. So you just like push through the papers and you just do the bare minimum to just maintain the job. It's a boondoggle, as we said. It's just make work work for people who can't really be hired in like the actual um, private industry in many cases. And then, of course, it's another typical thing. You're always going to find the situation where if somebody stands to earn $100 million from a certain pr project. And if there was no law setting them to have this project, they wouldn't have $100 million. It would be like $100 million or zero. So if the $100 million, if this scheme is set up and you can actually get that scheme versus zero, if the scheme isn't set up and you can lose out because there's more competition, there's less regulation in this government, in this department, you might not even get that job at all. You might not get to build these more roads. Then it's going to behoove you to spend upwards of $90 million yeah. on, on, on lobbying to make sure that that policy is actually set in place, because that's still a gain of $10 million that you were not going to get at all if that system wasn't in there. So this is, a, this is just a system that once you have this institution, that's always going to be a situation where people in the private industry, in markets, will actually be incentivized to lobby and bribe and corrupt the actual people in the government. And if you truly are like us and think humans are humans and we have these different likes and we, we're, we're fallible, the level of temptation to actually get some of these things is, to me, it was kind of odd. Like I, I saw here in Kenya, like some politicians will just be, like we mentioned, $10,000 to Americans is, some Americans say it's just nothing. But the amounts of corruption that happens here in Kenya, like sometimes we'll say like somebody got corrupt because they were just given like a hundred dollars to just do the same thing. Like this person sold out some kind of, um, this person sold out a plan, a policy that's going to now send $10 million from like the World Economic Forum to this neighborhood or this area that is not going to do it as well as if they actually had sent it to this other area because this person was given a hundred dollars by going out to like a bar and like getting some drinks and like that is a lot of money being swung around for like such a small amount of money or like this person spent like a few like a few thousand dollars to vote and get into power to be this uh mp's like member of parliament for this area and now that member of parliament is on a board and for five years he's involved in swinging like billions of shillings around so it's it's a weird type of thing to see that but realize that's also happening in the united states of america even at sh shorter levels like the local politicians are not outside of this yes you can look at the nancy pelosi's and say like how do these people become billionaires and things like insider trading but there's also yeah. local politicians local level politicians why do you think college towns, like we talk about these college yeah. town things, have certain protections? 
athletes? Why do you think certain athletes go to certain places and they get because they're earning so much money for those people? Those people are invested in that whole situation, that whole environment. Like, how many people are actually employed by the schooling indoctrination complex? Yes, we talk about the tens of millions of people that actually have student loan debt. Like, they said here, like, okay, so the, uh, when Biden and Reagan and all these people loosened the plans, like. The the <laughs> together with the two federal loan programs increased student debt uh, borrowing from uh, 1.8 billion in 1977 to 12 billion in 1989. So that's like that's like 12 years. So you think people were sitting around 12 years and just being like, hmm, okay, now we're going to hire all these people because one thing you have to realize is even if these people are not paying the money back, there's there's jobs being made to loan out the money. These yeah. jobs being made because the colleges, all these colleges have been paid. We talked about the endowments with this in, in the Ivory Tower series. Like this, this, the people have been paid already. That money is going out to the communities, to the areas. So the amount of people actually employed by the schooling indoctrination complex is way more than the actual. I think it's been more than the. Is it more than the students? No, it's probably not more than the students. Probably like half of the amount of the students. But these people are making a living from maintaining this system. So they won't want the system to actually end. Yeah, um, I just sent you a good article. I've uh, I've read it several times. It's probably one of my favorites. It's um, why regulatory agencies are uh, don't work. It's designed to fail. And it talks about uh, the concept of regulatory capture, which is kind of what you're getting at. Uh, for those who don't know, that's a an insight of public choice theory, basically. It, it used to be believed that, oh, people are rational, so leave people to their own devices. They'll do what they want. And then it, it became believed that well, we need government to regulate the excesses or do things that people don't like, but then public choice emerges as an answer to this because what happened was it was assumed, oh, we'll just put government agencies to regulate industry and then it'll clean up corruption and everything will be good. But then what the public choice economist realized is, well, what happens is you need to hire people who are who worked in those industries because they understand them, but the problem is they still have ties to those industries. So then they, in turn, once they're in power, once they're in the regulatory agencies, they do things favorable to those companies and wherever who they came from. And you know, there's all sorts of examples of this, like the former head of Monsanto running the FDA, you know, Goldman Sachs running the Treasury, uh, Gary Gensler at the SEC, he's from Goldman Sachs. Uh, you know, BlackRock is on the board of everything, all these other things. And he worked for the EPA for decades, and he actually wrote about this, and he was saying it's interesting because you know there's relationships between like regulators and oil executives and how if you do certain things for companies they'll give you a job at that company as sort of like thanks for doing that if you don't play ball with them they basically make your life hell until you leave um anyone who tries to change things they basically drive them out so it's like his argument is like these agencies can't regulate these industries because it's just there's too much temptation for corruption there's too many conflicts of interest like yeah officially there's rules like oh you you work for Goldman Sachs, you enter the treasury, you have to sell your stock. Okay, fine, but it's like, <laughs> you still have ties to those previous employees. Like, I know Hank Paulson, who was the secretary of the treasury under Bush, he mentored Lloyd Blankfein, who was CEO at the time during 08. And then you figure Goldman got money, Lehman was allowed to fail, Lehman was one of their main competitors. So, you know, if you're being charitable, you could say, well, they didn't save Lehman in time, but you kind of wonder, like, the whole treasury is run by Goldman and it's like, why is it their main competitor is allowed to fail? Like, this isn't by accident. Yeah, yeah and also, like, who do you sell your stock to? Like, yeah, I, I got a cousin. Sell your stock to your cousin. Your cousin sits on it. Then, like, you have some deal, 10% or it's, 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 it's a simple thing like yeah. that. Uh, what, one of the solutions to some of these is just say, if you work for the public sector, you're not allowed to get a job in the private sector for five years after that, like in, a, in, a, in a related field to whatever sector in the state yeah. you're in. That would be a yeah. simple system to kind of uh, employ yeah. that if you had a more just system. Yeah. But how many people are actually support this? Like they just recently, yeah. like there was a type of thing where it's like if you're in the military industrial complex, you can't actually be the the, the, um, the defense minister. But I think it was under Trump yeah. where he said like with Lloyd, like he applied for some exception to that. And again, that goes with the law. So some of these kind of unwritten law type of things that, oh, we should yeah. have a civilian in there, but not some of these things kind of change. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's this right now with this current system, why does, why does anybody think that more government involvement in this system that has been created by government involvement is the solution to what happened after more government involvement was happened? Because nobody can really argue that the schooling indoctrination complex or the actual education system, let's talk about the real education system, has been has had less government involvement and spending today than it has. And this is across the board. Like we, one of my other objections with this whole thing of talking about um, different costs and different spending, oh, the government is doing this and their loans are doing this. But how many people on the political left also talk about how like 
government it's a government expenditure and federal income security like welfare and social services in the 1960s it was um it was around uh i don't know it was somewhat somewhat around it was this in billions of dollars it was somewhere around like two billion dollars mm. and then by the end of obama's term it was around uh 200 and uh, 220 billion dollars so that's shot up people don't really complain about that government social benefits to persons to so federal so snap uh, assistance programs and things like that back then of course it wasn't even there back in 1960s it's hardly there and now it's up to 80 billion dollars so they, they talk about how the government needs to spend more on xyz but what is an actual venue that they say needs more government spending that hasn't had an exponential growth in government spending over the last 10 years. I can't think of one. Can, can you? Well, because well, like Gensler in his um, interview with Jon Stewart, he talked about the SEC got a 3% funding cut under Trump, but I'm like, 3%, what is that? It's like, what private company goes under if it loses 3% of its funding? It's like, yeah. like it's just like, that's just an excuse. It's like, I mean, I you know, I, I, as a restaurant manager, I remember like you'd cut servers if they if it's like slow or something and you work the station and it's like, if you're doing the math at the time, like, you know, there's like four servers, two busters, whatever. It's like you're cutting like 10 percent of your staff for the night, but you still do things. And it's like, you know, like what what is that extra three percent really that crucial? Like that just that comes across as an excuse to me. Uh, uh. Yeah. And with some of these figures, they, they say it's like oh three percent over what? Like it's like the recent thing with <laughs> Joe Biden saying there was zero percent. Uh, <laughs> They were saying there was what zero percent inflation, and what it was like two months ago they said that because it was zero percent over what it was zero percent yeah. over the eight point five percent was already there. You know they'll say like oh we've re we've returned to we've we've uh, we've gained x five hundred thousand jobs, but it's five hundred thousand yeah. jobs from what it's like five hundred thousand jobs from already being negative tw two million from yeah. what it was two years ago. So th yeah. these figures, they can always like juice these figures, mess, mess yeah. around with these figures where it does not necessarily make sense. Like a 3% reduction in the SEC's funding over the last, uh, what's it called? Over Trump's time doesn't really matter that much if between, yeah. if during Obama's time, there's a 9% increase from what it was before, because that's still yeah. a 6% increase over the last like 20 years yeah. in that case. I think like even like recently, uh, Joe Biden was like before, of course, this, student loan a boondoggle that's probably going to cost like at least i think lower estimates is like 300 billion dollars over the next 10 years they talked about the so-called inflation reduction act those are actually going to like um drop the amount so you see he dropped the deficit like around a trillion dollars but he's talking about dropping the deficit what's he comparing to because during the actual pandemic there was all this stimulus money that was in emergency time where they said okay we're going to print out these trillions of dollars it's a one-time thing it's not like a recurring thing and since that was on part of the budget during 2020 and 2021 that's something that has expired it's not being renewed in 2020 in 2022 so he's saying oh we've dropped it 1.3 trillion dollars but that 1.2 trillion dollars was something that was a one-time addition so these figures just come out and yeah i am i'm really still taken aback sometimes at how people just buy this stuff yeah well because because like the or like i remember this was came up a few years ago with um oh they want to cut military spending but it was just reductions in planned increases it wasn't like yeah. cuts back way back yeah. <laughs> yeah how do they it's like what was that thing uh is, is it like I think it was like uh, like Jesse 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 from like Breaking Bad or something. Like he can't keep getting away with it. I'm just like, how do? What is? And, and this is maybe this is the thing. Maybe because of the student loan debt thing. Like I'm very risk averse when it comes to like taking out people's money. Like even borrowing, yeah. it's like even like taking loans of myself and risking things of myself. Maybe I should be more uh, confident in myself and do things. But yeah. it's just weird. Like. If people fall for the government type of rhetoric, then maybe they actually do fall for this easy money type of thing. Because this is one thing that I, I used to say about Kenyans. It was like somebody who could steal a chicken or steal like a sack of potatoes could get lynched by a mob. They could beat this wow. man and kill him, stone him into death. And, yeah. But then a politician can drive by who, as I said, was corrupt for like 100 shillings or something and these billions of shillings are going around. But the average Kenyan couldn't really visualize that we're still not really dealing with cash that much people don't have bank accounts so they don't really yeah. realize oh i can have hundreds of thousands like people are still living on like a dollar a day so for them to really be able to visualize what a million dollars is that the politicians are are 
yeah. going around with. They can't really think that's that's the person I should be lynching because they can't visualize that. But then I'm overestimating them thinking the average American can visualize that amount of money, and I don't think they can. I, 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 don't, I really don't think the average human being can truly visualize what a trillion dollars is. Like, that's so much money. Like, what well, I, I, think it's, I think it's also the psychology of if you pay for it directly, whereas it's taxpayer-funded, because um, there's that chart. I, I, feel if, I don't know if you've seen it going around. It was used. It's used for healthcare a lot, where it shows, like, you know, in one quadrant, it's, you know, you spend the money and it's on yourself. Okay, you economize, seek the highest value. Someone else spends on you, but um, it's for you. Okay, you're going to seek the highest yeah. value, but you don't you don't care because you're not paying for it. And then it's money from other people is spent on other people. It's like, well, you don't economize, you don't seek the highest value. And then there is the one other because it's just illustrating like you you you're more and more detached from whose money it is and who it's being spent on. So you care less and less about how well it's spent. Whereas if we had a free market in medicine and you were going to doctors and paying, you'd be conscious of, okay, how much does this cost? Is this really how much this costs, et cetera? And yeah. that's come up a lot with things like LASIK surgery or some of the cosmetic stuff is they, they've gone down in price repeatedly because of the idea that, okay, um, you know, it's Active like because surgery, people pay yeah. for it out of pocket, there's incentive to drive down the price. So. Yeah. And I think I was saying like your money and your money has the highest interest. Your money on other people is the second yeah. highest interest. Other people's money on you is the third highest interest, and then the lowest interest is other people's money on other people. Yeah. You know, it's like the four different quadrants of it. But yeah, yeah, I think maybe now, I don't know if you have anything else to say, we can transition into like some potential solutions of some of these things. So some of the things that we think might be able to fix them, it's like we've just talked about like the bankruptcy type of thing. I think one of the easy things was in this situation, just allow, allow people to declare student loans in bankruptcy. Like, yes, I know the taxpayer is getting screwed in this kind of sense, but why should there be protections for this specific thing and, and not other things, in my estimation? Yeah, because it's like you can default on credit cards and go bankrupt, but you can't do that with student loans. Yeah. Yeah. Because you really have this kind of system. Now people are saying, some people are saying, oh, freeze the payment system. I don't think that should be frozen. Like I said, any government involvement, I'm not for that. So that's that's what yeah. I think the government is involved in saying you can't declare bankruptcy. If the government leaves that, that's one of the situations where I say, OK, yes. And I think when you have that, a college will be more interested. Now, they, they, some some colleges will be more incentivized to say, like, hey, this person could just say they're bankrupt like right now. Because right now they're saying, they're sticking down to percentage and saying if you're below a certain percentage of earning, you don't really have to even pay anything back. And what's the incentive for that? Someone can now say like, okay, if the government says when I graduate, if I take out $10,000 in student loan, if I graduate and I'm only earning $20,000, all I have to do is pay 5% of this money for yeah. 10 years and then after that I'll be forgiven. Yeah. Somebody can, and then the way student loans in America work for those of you who might not understand is Let's say you go to a school that costs five thousand dollars a semester, but you qualify for ten thousand dollars a semester. They give you the ten thousand dollars. That five thousand is paid. It's paid directly to the school, but the school re gives you a cash rebate of whatever is overflow. So somebody who's responsible might say, "Okay, I'm only going to take out uh, two thousand five hundred dollars because I can get a job." Or somebody might think, "I can take two thousand five hundred dollars because I can also get a job in the school cafeteria, and that will actually pay out the rest." And then. I will also might even be able to earn a bit more. So the second I graduate, I'll be able to actually pay it back, like half of it. I already have saved half of that. Um, I already have saved $5,000 for my four years in school with summer jobs and things like that. So the second I graduate, I'll pay the 5000 back. And then over that next couple of years, I know I'll be able to earn a job that costs, that gives me like, um, it gives me like, fifty thousand dollars a year so i'll pay back that five percent in the next i'll, I'll pay back that uh, five thousand dollars left with the interest i think it might take a bit longer for that i'll pay it back in seven years so they know that yeah. but somebody else might also think i still only have to pay five percent for that entire time so why don't i take the entire ten thousand dollars i qualify for it so I can get that five thousand dollars extra and get an apartment outside of the school, have some money to go on vacations and do over the yeah. summertime and things like this, do yeah. some some extra things, get my get get a car, things like that when I'm in school. I've seen people do that. That was my general experience. Like I went to school for I, I went to school with like a partial uh, scholarship when I was in in college for partial scholarship for American football, and I was a of course foreign student, so like my salary was like the amount of thing was still like twice as much as it and. 
my parents did help out in that kind of situation. So definitely thankful to my parents for that. So people were like, oh, you're one of those people that's blessed with all sorts. Yeah, okay, so I was helped out by my parents, but I was also not able to actually get to work because they didn't have a work permit yeah. on the football team in some situation. So it's it's different kind of situations. So there's there's some struggles with that kind of situation. Yeah. But that that was that was my background. But I knew a lot of people on the football team in the school that were just getting thousands. Thousands of dollars from the government because they were they 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 were able to actually qualify for multiple times more than it was the actual cost for them to actually go to the school. So yeah. that that situation is is something that that needs to kind of be fixed. In that situation, you're going to incentivize people to say, "I'm going to take what's stopping me from taking out a hundred thousand dollars, even if even if all I need is twenty thousand dollars, I'll take a hundred thousand dollars because in this payment system, all I have to pay back is is ten thousand dollars. So whether yeah. I take out ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, I'm still going to have to pay ten thousand dollars back in the next ten years. So why why wouldn't people take out more? What's stopping people? And do people just think that people are just so well meaning that they'll take the bare minimum? Who actually mm-hmm. thinks people work like this? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> right. So another solution, of course, would be have the schools the schools with the actual uh, student loan debts pay some of this back. Um, I don't know exactly how that actually be worked out. Uh, to say like hey, that's that's well, tough. Another the schools with uh, with uh, the what's it called um, what are those things called endowments and yes 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 yeah. Well, because my 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 issue, my issue with the, my issue with this whole situation is like like very few people on the left talk about going after the colleges. It's always just oh I'm in debt I can't find a job bail me out. It's not okay. Do you feel that your education was worth everything you paid? You know and then. I'm sort of torn on this because some people had ideas about like, oh, make the colleges refund the money if they don't get a job. But it's like, I don't know how I feel about that because I feel like that could open the door to all sorts of corruption. Like you said, like people being pushed into government because those are jobs or, you know, maybe the the bar for what a job is would be really low. I don't know. I think that could get messy, too. That's you know. Yeah, that would be tough. Because um, it's like, I think- you know, it's it's not like oh, do you, you should earn median income or get your money back, but then you might also have people who just continue to study worth, worthless things and they just get bailed out because they know, oh, well, I'll be safe either way. So I think that creates a lot of moral hazard too. Uh. I think one of the incentives, one of the things that should be done in a in a proper forgiveness system is like if you if you have to return something and you get your, your cash back in that kind of situation, you have to return the actual goods. Uh, yes, yeah. I guess there's some situations where you can say you sold me something good. I can prove it wasn't it wasn't good enough. I don't have to actually return it to you. Like uh, you can say you can get like credit. Someone okay, like you, you get something from a grocery store. You get home. It turns out the food is spoiled. You take a picture of it. You send it back to the grocery store. You don't have to return the spoiled milk or something. And they give you like some credits to take the milk, but you don't actually get to actually drink the milk and enjoy the milk and then say like like get some cash back for giving to it. So I think there should be some kind of system where it says okay. If you've paid back your loans for 50% of the degree that you took of the cost of the credits, then you get that money forgiven, but that degree goes back. And the degree you can go back does not necessarily mean you'd be fired from the job that you have, because many people are not really even working in the field that they got the degrees. And also, if someone has employed you and trained you, they don't really care that much. But you shouldn't be able to just still call yourself a doctor this, doctor that, if you've actually decided to like forgive that amount of money back. So I think there could be something like that that they can be. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, again, kind of, I mean... I'm in favor of just allowing, I think broadly, I think the solution here may be just be to allow more alternatives like Praxis and other things. Uh, mm-hmm. Some people talked about doing more a la carte education ideas, like maybe pay to take certain classes and get like a certification for that class. So it like would be yeah. cheaper. And then if you need to, if you need to uh, go back and get more, you can, but it's like, you can kind of build up your resume with different classes rather than, okay, you go to a place for four years, you use some of it, most of it's worthless and then you know that's it because it's like we talked about in the ivory tower series but about people being funneled into english and other classes because they're basically creating jobs for faculty members it's not like everyone's going to use it when they come out in fact a lot of people don't you know yeah, yeah. now i think also another system that could be done is a payment system just have a yeah. payment system where you don't get the money up front where the yeah. money is paid for like an actual service. Cause they do this like with loans and cars and things like when you give a car, someone's like, okay, this car is, 
you have an agreement with the person selling you the car that this car is yeah. actually going to be useful over a certain amount of time. And if something is wrong with the car, you shouldn't have to just pay for it all up front. Yes, you can buy a car straight cash. So crash from the beginning, but that's up to you if you're actually doing that, then you're not actually owing someone back. But just have like a system where this works together with the banks and the schools. Where, first of all, this is, you'd have to get the government out of the system. This yeah. is now estimating that this, the state isn't in there. The state isn't in there demanding banks must give loans to certain people. The, the banks can set this. Is, think about a more free market type of environment. A bank would be able to set whichever standards it wants to who actually gets the loans. Or private entities would be able to like say, okay, I'm going to fund this person this amount of money for it. But then the school will say, I'm, I'm providing this level of education for this student. And I'm confident enough to say, like, just pay me the basic amount I need to cover paying the teachers and supplying the location and whatnot in order to actually teach this kid. Yeah. So let's just say, OK, it's they say this this degree is going to cost you twenty thousand dollars. But to teach you this, I need at least ten thousand dollars to pay the teachers and the electricity and all this. So I'm going to take the ten thousand dollars. And if you can't pay the 20K off the break, I'll say I'll set amount and say like okay the 20k is going to be now with an interest up to like two thousand two hundred dollars or twenty thousand dollars yeah twenty two thousand dollars we're going to say that's that's it because we're going to put that ten percent interest on that situation and then you have a an understanding to say like we are so sure that this thing is valuable of the 20k so they'll actually incentivize more students to not pay it up front and take this payment system because they'll understand that. In a system of me, of you paying me back, um, they'll say, I guarantee that when you graduate from this job, you'll have a 100K job. So all we're going to do is take um, a certain percent, take 10% of your pay for your first 10 years after you graduate. Then once they take that 10%, that will be automatically coming into them. And then that will pay off more than that $22,000. They can say, if you pay us back that $22,000, whenever you pay us that back, it's done. Then whatever else is like 10% for the link. So they have that kind of agreement where they can set up that system. Mm -hmm. Then the banks will make sure that, or a private person will make sure that if we're going to loan this person the money to pay that initial 10,000, they're also somebody who will be able to earn, who were, they've shown us, they've proven to us that they'll be able to actually pick, first of all, a school that's going to teach you something that's worth it. They know there's jobs in here. You'll have systems and you have businesses working like with they work with practice that they'll actually be in touch with the actual education system, the schools, or they'll have smaller pods of education. You'll actually be learning at the actual business. You'll be employed at the business will sign up. This is something they used to do. The business will sign a contract and say, since you're contracted to work with us, we'll actually pay for your school and things like this. So this can be other systems like this where these things can work. And there's other countries in the world where some of these things work. Even in the United States of America, there's certain levels of businesses and jobs that these things still, still work. Somebody will be very useful to like a law firm, very useful to like a certain sort of business. They'll go in for extra learning. I had a friend here who was working for Oracle and they paid for him to go to India for like a year and learn some new course because he was actually going to help them. And then he came back here and now he's establishing that in East Africa. So this kind of systems work. This whole idea of just the K through 12 pipeline directly into school I think there's part of that is also the K through 12 thing goes into there. Of course, we saw the Project Veritas thing with this indoctrination, uh, the political leanings of people in the school indoctrination complex, the amount of donations they give is like 95% Democrat. And it's not just middle yeah. range Democrats, like regressive left leaning re type of activist type uh -huh. of thing. So I think there is an incentivized to keep those people in that system. Yeah. Of course, We've talked about the dilution of just the jobs and things like that, the inflation, where yeah. people are like stuck in certain jobs. So they don't they want to, I think, retard how soon people can enter the job market because they don't want they want less competition for those fewer jobs they have in these different markets and things like this. Yeah. We talked about the make work boondoggle jobs of the people who are employed yeah. in the school indoctrination complex. So right now, with the state involvement into it, of course, the votes and the systems like that, the more reliant you keep people on it. The government, I think you'll see people in the government have a higher percentage of liberal arts degrees employed in yeah. government positions than you have like in the private sector. So it's also a, a it's also a funding system for creating government bureaucrats and things. So it's this right, right now it's just a mess, but we we get some basic solutions. And I'm, I'm open to seeing the other solutions people have out there. Or maybe we'll come back with more solutions like think about things. Because that that's something that I thought of that system of 
the school agrees that they will not necessarily be paid all up front, but their payment comes from guaranteeing or from investing more in your solution after. Because most colleges don't really give a damn about what you do after unless they're raising money. And I think that's one of the things I think James Lindsay and other people have talked about where the actual change is finally going to happen now that schools are being exposed and the donors are starting to see like, wait, you're, who's who's teaching at my school or or what kind of degree or you're spending this much money or what kind of thing? Because it's still, thing, yeah. it's still, I mean, there's a lot of government money coming to schools, but still a majority of even public state schools have a lot of funding from um, from private private sector people who they also like this because they have prestige because it's they still have their job they're still achieving the job but they want to yeah. be able to like oh i went to harvard law school that's still like top thing that you want to be able to say oh i went to georgia i went to the university of georgia in this department i'm but if they start seeing that university of georgia is dropping in the standards they yeah. lose the prestige of being among their friends and that's those uh, circles we're talking about like lizzo and the megan markles of showing off and saying oh, i went to wharton Bi business school if wharton business school is now just no longer a word that they can throw around that's a less kind of thing they can hold up as <laughs> as a shiny type of thing so i think that's one of the things that will, that will help reduce some of this um raise the standards again but do you think do you think that's even something that's happening what what, what are your, what well, are your thoughts i would say that's happened already because like i mentioned before with legacy and missions and affirmative action and stuff and it's backlash because like i have a friend i guess he's he's mixed race technically he's like he's black he's native american a few other things and he talked about how in academia a certain percentage of people thought he was an affirmative action hire off the bat and the thing is he's com he's, he's competent at what he does but it's like but now there's that stigma because it's okay is this person here because they're good or you know did they did were they just here to fill some quota and i understand the argument against this that in the past it was like okay if you were black you had to jump through all these hoops to get through academia i understand that but it's like it went so far in the other direction that now it's like okay were you just pushed through because we didn't want lawsuits and i forget if it was i think it was james Lindsay too who had a story where he was talking to a black kid about his time in school and he was saying how he intentionally got things wrong and he saw that the teachers were afraid to correct him because they didn't want to be accused of bigotry but it's like that he did that intentionally to see how they'd react and if they're doing this regularly it's like what does that say about the standards yeah yeah, yeah. and there's also just the, the general things another another negative thing that happens from the schooling system is if people are incentivized to have quotas to let certain people in drop the standards in i i was um i experienced teaching here in kenya i was teaching some illustration and animation courses i had some students who had grown up in Nairobi, the capital city here, who were aware of computers their whole life. I had some students who were in university from the village, so they were just taking an arts degree. So trying to teach somebody who's never actually even opened a basic app, under, understands shortcuts like control C, control V, or like how yeah. to save a file, versus people who know more about apps than even I do. So trying to teach them how to use flash animation, it's the, the, the difference of the level, because you don't have the ability to really choose and select a certain group of people who are already interested and aware at a basic level about this certain thing. So the system is already at that point where those kids would be better off if they were at a lower level course, just learn the basics of computing. It would be better off if me as a teacher, I had the ability to select and say, I'm only going to teach students that have achieved this level of awareness that fits what I want to teach them. But that system is not the system that you have here. So you have people no. saying, I have to take those kids. So you have colleges saying, okay, you have to take these kids into a certain school. And that kid is also having his time wasted. Because if you're like, okay, now we'll just do it halfway. The people who are more advanced, they have to bring their stuff down. They're not going to learn as much. The people who are really below the qualifications, they're not even going to be able to achieve that. And then they might get dissuaded from even learning computers, learning animation, and they might drop out of the field completely. And we see this in schools. Some kids are taken to certain schools where they don't graduate and then they get dejected. And they they might have been able to still be in that field and still been able to give back to their community and things like that if they had gone to a level of teaching that was more at a more remedial level that could teach them the basics and then they'd work up to that level instead of just getting at that high level and being dissuaded from it. So this is something that we also kind of see. And then now it starts going like, oh, people from these certain communities seem to drop out more and all the, these are the stupid people. It's like, no, they're not stupid. They just happen yeah. to be put in a situation where they weren't given the more, the best kind of tools for their trade. It's kind of like if we all of a sudden said every NBA team had to take on three Asians in every practice, it doesn't, and the Asians kept not making teams. 
it's not that we'd say like, oh, Asians suck at basketball. It's just like there's not that many Asians who are just really, really that good at basketball. But doesn't mean Asians can't play basketball. It doesn't mean there's, there's no level of playground <laughs> basketball that Asians couldn't achieve. So that, that, that's the kind of thing that where, where I think um, this incentivizing people to take things that they don't need to do. And of course, this is a debt trap that people are just... That's one of the unfortunate things about this, because regardless of what we're talking about here, people do have debts. There's people, this <laughs> this 600, what's 600, 800,000 people with over $300,000 in student loan, or is it over, over $200,000 in student in student loans. Who are these people? What are they doing? Like, that's that's an unfortunate, like, I just, I don't think you can think this is a healthy system that can get that many people in this much debt. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like they always give me this thing about good intentions and people should have the chance and all that. But it's just like people are not equal. It's like, I mean, you know, uh, math I've struggled with. It's like you put me at MIT, I'm going to fail easily. I know that, yeah. you know, it's like it's like it, it just means you have to do a better job of figuring out what people are better at. And I got to look more into it. But I, I heard in Germany they have more of an apprenticeship program where mm -hmm. the idea is like if you don't like school, it's okay, let's train you to do some like blue collar jobs and see how you do. And then if you like that, okay, do you want to do this for a living? And then like transition into that. So it's like people actually learn productive skills. And they said that they have a very small underclass there, at least last I heard, because you actually have people who it's like, okay, if you don't like school, you do something hands on, you like that, you, you do that. If you don't like that specific job, try something else. And it's like, it's sort of directing you towards potential avenues. Whereas I think the issue in this country especially is that so many people look down on the trades as like this is dirty work or whatever but it's like i mean you know good plumbers make six figures a year like you know 100 something k i mean you know master cabinet makers if you get that good they make a lot of money it's like it's just it, it was seen as like these are dirty grimy jobs you have to go to college that's what smart people do but then it's like Again, we just have the whole situation that we described. So yeah. yeah, and that's one thing that I see a lot of people on the political left who are more about like free everything. They're yeah. also like, oh, we need take out the fact that the taxation levels are a lot higher with these people I and mean, a lot of these yeah. kids. Take out the fact that the K through 12 is a lot more rigorous than it is in the United States of America and in some of these Scandinavian and European countries. Take yeah. out the fact that again, there's other systems like you're saying with the with the vocational schooling and things yeah. like that. They just like, oh, we just want the free aspect. They don't really understand everything else that goes that free aspect. Part of the things also just more smaller countries, of course, they're more home, they're also the homogeneity. So you can kind of select and study and test certain kids to come up to certain kind of conditions and things like this. Most of the people are also very invested in living in that one particular location. So they kind of have thought, I'm going to do this in a certain job. They're not really thinking about traveling to different kind of places. Whereas you just have a lot more mobility in the United States of America. And again, another situation with this, if this is so popular, you don't need an executive order in a supposed once in a millennial type of pandemic in order to actually do this. Why don't yeah. they actually just make the case for this and actually propose it as a law and change the actual laws with this? Why don't they do that? Because you have some people like, oh, this is the most popular thing. It's very popular. But then it's like, no, they write this in a bill. How come it's not actually passing in a bill? Why aren't you actually actually seeing some of these things actually get out there? Because there's actually not a good case of this. And that's, that's the thing. If anybody's listening to this, thank you all for listening, of course. Let me know if you've heard of a good argument for why all student loans should be forgiven or why it should be tuition-free made for it. I haven't really found any actually good arguments for those things. No, because the thing is, I say all this stuff, and the argument I get from lefties is always like, oh, I think everyone should have the chance. But I'm like, OK, but you understand that's why this was started. It just led to the situation we have now. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I mean, that's not my yeah. opinion. That's that's what happened. You know, it's like because if, if like, someone's well, arguing, yeah. like if someone right now is arguing 10,000 is good or, or instead of 10,000, maybe we should go to like the middle group, which is like the most. Let's 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 yeah. make it let's make it 20,000 or 25,000 because they said, OK, it's, it's a different chart here from um, some other place I found, okay, it says 12 million people are, around 12 million people are 10,000 to 25,000. So let's just say it's 25,000. So that's it. So we'll do it 25,000 because that's going to, it's going to help 12 million, 7 million, 8 million. That's going to help about 30 million people if, if you do it that much. And then the people right above that, 4 million people probably have it halved. Why not go all the way to say, let's forgive even the 200,000, let's forgive 300,000 people. Why don't we get a situation where instead of the 300,000, let's just send 300,000 to every single family that's been to school. So the, the people who yeah. paid, uh, why don't we just, why don't we just, the tax break instead? So $300,000 tax break forgiveness for 
the next 50 years until everybody who's graduated in the last couple of 50 years gets their money back for that kind of school. Why don't people go to that amount? Why do they limit it to $10,000? Why do they limit it to $25,000? It's the same question I ask with minimum wage. Why should yeah. it be 15 bucks? Why not $50? Why not $500? Yeah. So it's, whenever you get this situation where you say, this entity needs to force these people to do X, why do you limit it to X and not go to like X, Y, Z, Q, P, Q, all these other things? Well, it was, what's funny too is they mock us for saying like, why not fifty dollars an hour? Why not a hundred? And they're like, well, at some point it should reasonably stop. But I'm like, but that, but how is that unreasonable? Because I'm like, you can live off a little bit of money. I mean, I came here, I was making close to minimum wage. I, I live in this tiny room, you know. Um, I was eating pizza and fried chicken, like you know, you can get by on a little bit. But then their argument would be something like, well, people should be able to live at a certain quality of life. But it's like, why are people entitled to a certain quality of life? And then that just raises that whole question. And then it's like. You know, if, if we're talking about survival, fine. But if, if it's, oh, I want a certain standard of living that other people should pay for, it's like, what's the case for that? Yeah, yeah and forget just the United States of America. Why are you so xenophobic? Why are you so self-centered? Why should you get a tuition-free $30,000 worth of education yeah. when there's still kids, millions of kids around the world that don't even have books, that can't even learn to read? Shouldn't you just work with $5,000? So that rest of the money can be sent all over the world to make sure everybody can read. Because if your if your K if your post grad education is something that's valuable, then shouldn't school for every single kid in the world be more valuable? Make every single kid literate in the world before you need to take a master's, before you need to take a, a graduate course or a, a bachelor's. Well, why don't people actually have that compassion for the rest of the world? That's again. Another thing, because you can see the limitations. People are like, no, we don't want it. A lot of these people who say, oh, we should have free everything for, for Americans, why are they limited to America? And a lot of these people are the people who say they're more compassionate about the world and more for globalization. Eh, they're, they're not really. Yeah, because that that's the argument they make for the whole school thing in general, human capital. Well, you know, again, what, like, it, one, it's like, why shouldn't that be extended elsewhere? And two, it's like, are you really generating human capital? If you can't find a job, it's a hobby. And it's like, Again, it goes back to my last point. You're just funding people's hobbies, and it's like, why is there a right to that? Like that, nobody has made the case to me for that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, you got anything else to say on this student loans, or have we talked this out pretty pretty thoroughly? Uh, I, th I think we've made all the points that I've thought of. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the origin solutions. Yeah, I don't have much else to say really. So once again, I, I I think this was this was a relatively clear uh, book by. I, I get that he's done it to the people, but this is another thing that I don't really understand the, necessarily the purpose. I think it's actually more a ploy to go further on and for 2024 to say, okay, now that we've done this, we've seen the effect of some people being forgiven and we felt some of those effects. Let's get you to continue because if we get the Democrats back into the into government, get Democrat president and a Democrat House, a Democrat Congress again. We'll be able to do more of the type of things that we did when during Joe Biden's first two years, because I think the Republicans are more stuff going to take back the the, the House. It's a good, yeah, they're going to take back the Congress, but they don't know about the Senate. So that, that that I think is what's going to happen. Because in my estimation, when you have these more midterm elections, majority of the people who will be single issue voters, especially vote for Democrats already live in very deep blue areas. So it's yeah. not like getting them to come out to vote more on local, like local level, state level, um, state level competitions and Congress people and things like that. It's not really going to change and affect them because most of these people are in cities. People in the flyover countries don't really have these levels of debt to this kind of extent. So no. I, I don't think it's really going to have necessarily that much of an effect on this. These people will probably going to vote for you already. And yeah. if they were going to vote, they're not really going to swing places where you were you had a chance of losing seats, in, in my estimation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think there'd be some swing voters that would be receptive to this, but it's like, is it going to be a huge percentage? I don't think so. Oh. And it's also the simple thing, like, once you've gotten the money, like, why do you still need the person? <laughs> they yeah. might think, okay, let me vote for them, so eventually I can get the rest of it for, forgiven. But I, I, I don't really think that's that's that credible. But then again, I... If if you if you are listening to this and you took out student debts and you feel you were bamboozled and lied to, what do you think actually? Why do you think you fell for this thing that you think was a lie? Why do you think that was a good idea back then that now maybe you don't think it's a good idea anymore? What do you think can be done to improve that system of educating and informing um, families and kids who take out these loans? in a better way than the current system is actually doing. Because I think if there is a system where there is 
an injustice being done, kids are being indoctrinated, but this is why I don't believe in universal suffrage because like, people are not really that well informed on anything. So if people can't really decide well to take out a loan for their personal life, for their personal future, you can also see the same results when they vote for what other people are going to do. Like we talked about the whole thing, like your money for you, spent on you, other people's money spent on you, other people's money, no, you know, your money spent on you, your money spent on other people, other people's money spent on you, other people's money spent on other people. So yeah, when it comes to voting, you're voting for that last section. You're voting for what other people's money, who are not even born yet, are going to do to like other people who are alive right now. So that's that's the kind of situation. So that people care the least about that, the level of actual understanding. Even most people think, like even with colleges, they understand this is college, there should be some standards for people to actually enter college. Yes, they might say it's low. Yes, we should have quotas for stuff. But people, very few people want to go to a college where anybody can just walk in and take a course. They want to feel like I achieved some kind of thing. Yet those same people will say in voting for the people who decide how colleges are ran and paid for and funded and things like this, Anybody should be able to decide. There's a big disconnect that happens, and I I still don't really understand how how people are in that mentality. Well, do you want do you want me to answer the question as it applies to myself? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, I went to culinary school, Culinary Institute of America. I wanted to be a chef for a number of years. I worked in kitchens for a number of years. We did a whole interview on that. I'm not going to rehash everything here. Discovered it wasn't for me. Got in the front of the house and got into investing and trading during lockdown. You know, did well with that, so I kept going. Uh, my advice to people would be in the case of cooking, because I mean, it's the only career I've done that front of the house and what I'm doing now. Um, in the case of cooking, if you want to do it for a living, just go work in actual kitchen, see what it's like before you go to school. Like I did for a little bit, but I only worked at a retirement home, which is an institution. So it's not exactly the same as a regular restaurant. Like you work fewer hours, there's less pressure, all that. So what I would say is go to a restaurant that you like, um, you know, start dishwashing, peeling potatoes, whatever, and then basically say, I'll do whatever. Then if you do a good job, try and get a cook position and then live the life for a bit, work full time, work the holidays, weekends, whatever. And then ask yourself, OK, do I want to be doing this, you know, the next 20, 30 plus years, whatever. Um, and, you know, just really immerse yourself in the industry and ask that question, because. Again, we I think we talked about it in the other discussion, but culinary schools, unfortunately, have lowered their standards. And one theory behind that is that they're sort of duping people who don't know what the industry is like into it. Because if you have experience, if you worked in the industry a while, you'll know whether you want to do it or not. But the thing is, there are a lot of people who don't understand what the industry is like. Then they work in it and they realize they're in way over their head. It's not what they thought and everything. But it's like you already went to school, spent all that money, spent all that time. So it's like, you know, you can't refund all that. So I think they're sort of preying on people. It's sort of like the predatory housing thing, like they're sort of taking advantage of people. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to defend the colleges, but it's also we all have to do our own research, too. And I think you just have to talk to other people in the industry. Like I said, I mean, the boomer generation is a little disconnected with how things are now. So it's like you have to talk to people maybe a little older than you, maybe people in that industry, see what they say. Just just sort of look, get a more thorough understanding from different points of view, I think, of what you're getting into and participate in it if you can. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the good things about living in current year. It's a place like Praxis, a lot of other places where you can do odd online schooling. A lot of these big major institutions, brick and mortar institutions, you can actually go and find their teaching material online. Like you can actually take the course material there. As I mentioned, you can actually go to colleges, many colleges, and just walk in on campus and actually take the courses themselves. And this is something that's easy to change around. Once the schooling system and incentives get changed around the city, we're going to pay people based on the actual results. Just imagine if the schooling system all of a sudden said the salary for teachers isn't going to be on tenure. Like, there's another thing, like tenure is a suspect thing. Like, why is there tenure in colleges? Yeah. When you just have a system where it's like, okay, we're going to pay you based on the average amount that your students actually graduated. But if we're doing this, we're also going to let you actually have a better and more selection system on who you take on as students. Just a simple system like that could all of a sudden just change the schooling system around. Really now with like the closing of the pandemic, we've talked about this more in other series, where it's just, hey, this thing has created the world, given the chance for the world to restart things in a, in a lot more effective way. A lot of people got to see what their kids are being taught in school by actually sitting there and watching the streaming, like, we don't like this. A lot of college students who thought we have to go to college were realizing, hey, why are they still charging me this amount of money if I can learn this stuff at home? And I'm actually yeah. able to actually learn this at home in like yeah. a a fraction of the time that it takes me to do it when I'm actually on this actual campus. So why am I doing this? They're looking at other fields where they're like, okay, these people didn't rely on an office. This plumber, there wasn't a lockdown for plumbers. 
Plumbers yeah. were still out there doing work because that stuff still needed to be happening. So yeah. you can you can kind of see where people are like, okay, because when you're talking about going in on actual place and actually just working in the kitchens, this is not something that's only limited to hands-on artisan type of fields. There's yeah. other, also other fields where you can go in and learn these type of things, the apprenticeship, the internship type of things. Yeah. And I think these are things that are increasing and it's a positive thing. In my estimation, just if you are about to take out a student loan and you're listening to this, <laughs> just rethink it. Make sure you have a lot more guarantees. What do you? What are the guarantees? They, they might be people out there who say, "Okay, I took out a loan and it worked out perfectly." I'd also like to hear from those people. And also, please check out the Stephen talked about the other series where we talked about the cooking thing. And I, I know great people series. Part of why I wanted to do that series is to talk to people who are doing things that I think are cool and interesting. And in that series, we also go into like how they learned it. And most of the people that we've talked to. Most of the things they learned about the great things that they're doing were not really in school. Like uh, there's a question in there where we ask, okay, what are a few things you learned in school, or what is something that during the time you were in school you hoped they would have learned? And it's a rather interesting question in there. And that's a series that we're building up slowly but surely. But you see, like in many other fields, in many of the fields that we've talked about, people are just learning by actually doing. Those who can teach. So find the people who can do the things that you want to do and are doing those things and see if they can teach you something or if you can learn something from them rather than the people who are saying, These, this is what we know about the people who are doing the stuff, trust us. Chances are those people are actually teaching you stuff that will only make you really good at doing what those people are doing and then those people have tenure so they don't want you taking their jobs to begin with. Yeah. Well, because well, my thing too with the apprenticeship thing is like, even if, if it's something you end up doing and finding out you don't like it, you still have work experience, you could still get a reference, you could still get them to refer you somewhere else. And it's like, even if you had a series of apprenticeships, like as a teen or something, you could just say, oh, I tried these different things, these weren't for me, but I gave it a shot and they said I did a good job, so they're willing to write me a recommendation. Then you just build on that from there. You know? Yeah. And I also think that that's... Well, that's what uh, Derek McGill, uh, his father, Lenny McGill, he said, because he there's a whole podcast I listened to a while ago. He runs the, one of the Glock stores in California, and he walked through his history. We talked about like being a cook, then a server, then he was on radio and eventually the store. And he had no college background either. And the bit of advice he gave, he made it the point multiple times. It's always stuck with me. He goes, even if you're doing something that you think is lousy or whatever, do it well, because if you work hard at it, people will see that and that'll open doors to other things. Um, yeah. And also when you're doing this thing, and if you don't really enjoy it or you're not really finding you're good at it, once you actually do that, you'll be able to understand what you're lacking in. And at that point, maybe you'll be able to go to college and say, okay, I only need two years. I don't need a full degree. I just need to go to this college in order to take this one course that's going to teach me the thing I actually am lacking from the actual industry. So you go in, maybe a year and a half, you take those two or three courses that you need and you get that knowledge and you leave. This whole idea that you have to be in there for the four years to get the full general education experience. No, you go in to learn what you need to do and then you leave. And this is another thing that we see like with athletes. Athletes go to college, they play college football, they play college basketball. Once they're good enough to go pro, they leave and go pro. <laughs> they don't have to stay in there for the entire four years because it's like an enriching environment. It's like, no, once you're able to do something professionally, do it professionally. You don't have to actually have the entire like four years and degree and things like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So I think that's yeah, it for now. Yeah. Been a good talk. <laughs> it's been a bit rambly, but I think we'll 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 get some of these back up and going. Uh, there's a few things we discussed talking about here, and just in this conversation, talked about more like the Wall Street type of thing. Um, I will come back on for that, and there's just things happening in society in general that uh, we might come back on with some more regular type of things. Another thing is like hey, podcasts. Keep talking about podcasts. Haven't gotten the podcast up, but once I get the podcast up, there's already a back library of things that I'll put up on there. And then I think once that's up and going. Uh, we'll work out with Steven to do a more um, streamlined, regular type of thing where even if we're not doing the other series that we're talking about, we'll maybe come on bi-weekly or weekly to just talk general, sh shoot the shit, as, as they say. As they say, right. yeah. All right. So, um, guys, gals, and everybody else in between, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.